I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday, June 11th, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call. Mayor Alahuzas? Here. Vice Mayor Chair Penny? Here. Commissioner Sieber? Here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Tim Ulysses, proclaimed ministry. Please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come together tonight in the agreement of unity. I pray your blessing and your favor over the city of Tarpon Springs, over every family, over every person that calls this city their home or their place of business. We also pray tonight for the leaders of this city that are here before us here, that you would grant them wisdom and understanding, a determination to lead this city and to make decisions with excellence according to your will and good pleasure. Lord, we thank you for the call of God that's on each one of their lives. And we ask that you would give them a strong compassion for the people of this city. And it's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. Lead us to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our commission meeting. It's nice to see so many people here today. Thank you very much for being here tonight. We'll begin our meeting with uh, com public comments on the items that will not be discussed tonight. If you have any comments, please come forward, state your name and your address for the record. You'll be given four minutes. Thank you. Pat Borowick, 2604 Oak Circle, uh, Tarpon Springs. Um, I was driving through town a couple days ago. I had a thought that maybe some of you have already had, but I had read the article about you're having a, a difficult time deciding where to put the uh, charging station, the final charging station, and uh, I was driving on South Pinellas and noticed again um, these, I don't know what they are, they jut out into the road taking up parking spaces and they're filled with st either stones or bricks. I don't know if they were intended to be little gardens on the side of the road or something at one time, but they just sit there with stones in them. And I thought, what about using one of those, the one closest to Tarpon Ave, and then you wouldn't be taking away a parking space that's already being used. And while you're at it, maybe take away the other ones too. They're kind of silly. <laughs> okay. okay, just a thought. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other public comments of the items that will not be discussed tonight? Good evening, Julie Wade, 1095 Main Sale. I understand that government creates more hoops to jump through than a, for projects than private businesses, but I'd like to point out some small issues that cause frustration for your constituents and sometimes for your staff. Brief background, 15 years ago, I could select anywhere in the world to live, and I came back to my birth state and selected Tarpon Springs. As those of you who attend, sponsor, or participate in local events know, I've tried to give back to the city that gave me a new home. Although I don't physically attend many council meetings, I do try to keep up. After the last meeting and some recent issues with the reclaimed water project, I felt it important to speak with you directly. I realize that most of you have full-time jobs and I respect that you are commissioners to better our city. But at the last meeting, two staff members came with requested progress reports. It was readily apparent that no one had called them with ideas or suggestions prior to the commission meeting. All the preliminary work that they had done was for naught, a barrage of off-the-cuff questions and ideas and unagreed upon consensus from the commission, even at, at the the very meeting sent staff back to square one with no clear guidance on their next step. There was an, even an allusion to some errors in previous photos without telling staff what the errors were. 
how frustrated staff must be not, no, not being given clear direction for Sunset Beach gates, maybe brick, maybe limestone, maybe coquina, maybe iron, maybe steel, maybe aluminum, maybe a sunset design, or maybe our complicated city seal. Can you imagine what that would look like split in two? No one would recognize it as anything. And the ongoing debate about the charging stations, oh my goodness. I implore you to give more explicit directions to staff so that they don't spend hours on research and pricing only to be given further conflicting guidance at the next meeting. It just delays everything. Finally, I'd like to give feedback on a, comp a completed project which I firmly supported, the reclaimed water for Grassy Point and Westwinds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Yes, I'm well aware that it turned out to be a much more difficult and complex project than initially inspected. As a benefactor of the project, even the completion letter with final steps was frustrating, such as call for your inspection, but no phone number was given. Text messages which said one could ask questions via text were not responded to. In when the inspector finally came, he gave me another list of additional requirements that nobody had keyed us into. In summation, communication between the board and staff needs to be improved. Communication between the city and residents needs greater clarification. And I think improvement in both those areas would eliminate some of the extended delays in project completions and help residents respect all our city does. We live in an amazing city that provides its own police and fire service, even makes and treats its own water. How special it is. How lucky we are to have such a scenic place in the world. Let's ensure that we work harder to protect our treasure, preserve our uniqueness, and continue to make enhancements that position us for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Peter Lackus, 514 Ashland Avenue. I'm sure most of you saw the headlines about 10 days ago, White House bars most Cuba travel. Another assault on those who don't speak English, who aren't pure white, and are different from us. There will be a discussion later, presentation about other people in our lives that are different. These policies are contraindicative to our economic development, our social development, and our security. Now here's why I want to point this out. Y'all all saw the front page headlines. How many of you saw on Sunday, May 26, back on page two of the business section, another article about Cuba. Cuba tries to revive its once great rail system. Cuba's Ministry of Transportation took possession on Monday of 80 new Chinese-made passenger cars, part of a promised consignment of 250 rail cars that will be delivered, received in the island by year's end. 250 rail cars. Now, I'm going to go further in the article. And restoring 2,600 miles of track communication lines, and dozens of crumbling rail stations around the island will be a monumental task. Where are they going to get that rail, that steel? China, Brazil, somewhere else. What did Mr. Trump put a tariff on? Steel. To help the steel and iron industries. What better way to help the steel in our industries and our manufacturing than building those 250 rail cars and that 2,600 miles of rail. 
90 miles away, 100 miles from Miami, ports. But they're getting it from China. And we want to slap tariffs on China. We want to slap tar tariffs on Mexico. Why? Because of the immigration issue? Nah. It's all about hate and anger and retribution. And who's going to pay for it? Not Mexico. Not China. We're paying for it. If you follow the business news, anywhere in the last week, once the stuff was issued about the Mexico tariffs, every economist on CNBC and Bloomberg were saying, whoa, it's going to cost us thousands of jobs, and it's going to take millions of dollars out of your pocketbook. Guavas, mangoes, avocados, tomatoes, cars, washing machines. How many has a Whirlpool or a Maytag washer they've bought in the last four or five years? They're built in Mexico now. Add 5% to a $500 washer, and then 10, then 15, then 20, and then 25. Who's paying for that? China? Not paying for it. Mexico's not paying for it. Lowe's and Home Depot, they can only absorb so much of it before they start asking you to pay more. So, we need to think about what we have ahead of us and what kind of America we want to be and what kind of future we want for ourselves and our children. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? Here, none. Thank you very much. We're now going to... Uh, Proclamations item number one on the LGBT Pride Month. The City of Tarpa Springs, Florida Proclamation. Whereas LGBT Pride Month is celebrated nationwide each year in the month of June. And whereas it's important during this month to take time to reflect on the LGBT rights movement. Whereas despite the extraordinary progress, LGBT Am Americans still facing discrimination simply for being who they are, and whereas the communities in Tampa Bay area stand with the uh, LGBT community in the struggle to ensure equal treatment for all and to defend and advocate the LGBT rights as a human rights, and whereas we will continue to advocate for statewide protection for all LGBT individuals to make our state a place where all people, regardless, are treated with dignity and respect. Now, therefore, I, Chris Alahuz, by virtue of the authority vesting in me, as the mayor of the city of Tarver Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2019 as LGBT Pride Month. And, I, and I'd like to invite uh, Jack Spurk to come forward to accept the proclamation. You want to take the word? Jack Spurk. <laughs> Jack Spurk, 2008 Golf U Drive, Tarpon Springs. Um, it's very fitting considering that uh, June has been a big month for uh, LGBT uh, people. Um, the 26th of this month, will mark the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, which started LGBT rights. Um, in 2015, the Supreme Court gave us the right to marry. Um, we, I was 19 years old when Stonewall happened. I don't know much about it other than that I was a scared 19-year-old, fully closeted person. Flash, you know, fast forward to today when I'm honored to be able to receive this uh, proclamation, I realized that, as the mayor mentioned, that we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go in the state. We have a long way to go on the federal level. But we are moving forward. It's a positive thing. We have an overwhelming support from the community. This means so much to my community that Tarpon Springs is recognizing that we are welcomed here um, 
I am humbled and honored and very proud to accept this proclamation. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Here none. Thank you. Item number two on the agenda is a proclamation. Vice Mayor Carapani will read the proclamation on Hurricane Awareness Month. Thank you. The City of Tarpon Springs proclamation reads, whereas Florida hurricane season officially begins June 1 and ends November 30th, and whereas Hurricane Awareness Month started to spread awareness of the dangers and hazardous of hazards of hurricanes, being aware is not being prepared, and history has shown that knowing vulnerability and what actions to take, people can reduce the effects of a hurricane disaster. And whereas we are better prepared than ever before today's storms, our technology, forecasting, and models have improved, and we have new ways of disseminating vital warnings and storm tracking information. Still, it is never too early to prepare. And whereas we enter hurricane season, let us renew our commitment to responsibility and let us unite in common purpose to safeguard our families and community. And whereas we can call upon organizations, schools, media, and residents to share information about hurricane preparedness. Now, therefore, I, Vice Mayor Townsend Terrapani, by the virtue of authority vested in the mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, who hereby proclaim June 2019 as Hurricane Awareness Month, and Chief Scott will be accepting this. Tarpon Springs Fire Rescue. Yeah, and stay at the podium since the next item is here. Uh, good evening. This is a good segue into our hurricane preparedness uh, presentation tonight. Um, again, it's uh, hurricane season. Uh, my name is Scott Young. I'm the fire chief of Tarpon Springs. I also handle the emergency management department uh, for the city. Um, I want to start off and let you know a few things, what's going on in the city. Uh, in uh, April, uh, the city staff uh, spent two days uh, in a hurricane drill. Uh, that we participated in along with the county and other departments throughout the county. Uh, this drill lasted, like I said, two days. It put us through our paces, uh, showed us some things we needed to work on and the things we can do well. Uh, and I think the city staff did a great job uh, uh, with all the tasks that were put in front of them and uh, I'm proud of them. Uh, second thing is uh, this year uh, we just got back from the Governor's Hurricane Conference. Uh, we sent nine people down this year from uh, the fire department, police department, Water Department, Public Works, and um, uh, Building Development. Uh, so we went down, we learned a bunch of new things, uh, brushed up on a few things to make sure we're ready, and uh, it was a good, good conference. Uh, one of the biggest conferences they've had in many years, about 20% uh, than the past year. So people are getting uh, the word out, getting uh, more educated in what we have to do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we need to be uh, ready for. Need a survival kit couple examples of what survival kits could look like um, but what you need in a survival kit is best to just try to get some big plastic bags put your stuff in the plastic bags seal them up put them in some bins and have them set aside and ready for the season uh, this way when the uh, storm is out there starting to brew getting ready you won't have to go to the store try to get all your stuff together get in the lines and be the last to picking up that last can of beans on the shelf you'll have what you want uh, basic stuff water uh, as it says up on the board there, one gallon of water per person for at least uh, three days. I would try to get maybe five days if I was most people. Uh, if you are on certain medications that make you uh, more dehydrated, you want to, might want to uh, put a little bit more in your uh, kit. Food, of course, three days, non-perishable food. Uh, food could be scarce at times, especially if we get a big storm. Uh, stores won't have much around, so you want to be prepared for that. Uh, Battery-powered radios. Uh, with hand cranks possibly, uh, NOAA radio so you can uh, listen to any new weather re alerts that come up during the uh, event or post-event, pre-event type things. Uh, flashlights of course, uh, first aid kits are good to have because you never know the scrapes and bangs you might take during the storm and after. Uh, a whistle, make sure you have a whistle. If you uh, get trapped in your home or somewhere you have a whistle and you can't move, you at least maybe be able to blow that whistle and let first responders know that you're there. Uh, something I never thought about till I was looking up some stuff and that was pretty interesting. 
Uh, a dust mask to help filter some of the contaminants that may be in around the house or wherever you're at. Uh, filter that uh, contaminated air out. Moist towelettes uh, for sanitary reasons, along with pa uh, plastic bags for your uh, personal items. Uh, a wrench, pliers, screwdrivers, uh, they come in handy. You never know when you might need one. Uh, turn off some utility utilities if you need to. Uh, one of the most essential things, if you have non-perishable foods, is a hand-cranked uh, can opener. Uh, electric ones probably won't work too, too well for you. Uh, local maps, of course, so you uh, have to leave the area, you can get around because Wi-Fi and things like that may not be up and available for you. And uh, of course, cell phones with the chargers and the battery backups if they have it. So let's, what about your home? You need to make sure your home is ready. Now is the time to start talking about trees and trying to get them trimmed and ready uh, so you don't have branches that might break off, fly around, break windows. Uh, the proper materials to advance in advance to board up your windows. Now is the time to start thinking about those things. Again, when the storm is out there and it's coming, you'll get a mad rush to Home Depot and Lowe's, places like that, trying to find wood to your windows or uh, doors. Uh, bring loose items around your house inside. Pools, uh, furniture is a good one to bring in. Sometimes you'll uh, hear people say just throw the pool furniture in the pool. If it can uh, go in there, that way it won't fly. Uh, and if you don't have room in your garage, it's a good place to put it. Secure doors on the property. Your most vulnerable, ah, your most weakest door, we'll put it that way, uh, is your garage door. Unless you have one of the new ones that are uh, reinforced, your garage door is always the weakest point. And if you can put your car inside, you don't want any flying debris damaging your car. So five things to know about having an evacuation plan. Find out where you need to evacuate. You don't need to travel hundreds of miles, you know, all the way up to Georgia or anything like that. You just need to travel as far away as your evacuation zone. Get out of the way. Uh, but do it early. I know during Irma, some of the people, I was just talking to a gentleman here, probably the pro one of the problems is people start booking hotels very early. So the longer your wait, the farther you're going to have to go to find some place to go. Uh, plan your evacuation route. Make sure you know where you're going to go and how you're going to get out. Communicate with somebody that you know that's out of your evacuation zone. Let them know where you plan on going, when you'll be there. Let them know when you're there and when you plan on leaving. That way, if they don't hear from you, they know that something may have happened and they can let authorities know. Very important. And plan for your pets. Again, we'll go over that in a minute, but most, pet sh most shelters do not take pets. Uh, only certain shelters in the, in the county will take pets. Your car, make sure your car is ready. Uh, first aid kits, the food, bottled water, a can of a tire inflator that you can buy at the uh, auto, auto stores that just helps uh, inflate your tire and get you to uh, your next location if you need it. Basic tool kit. Jumper cables, maybe some flares if you can find them, uh, good to have with you. Uh, flashlight, always good, especially if you're traveling at night, something you break down on the road. Uh, the DC AC power inverters for your car, that way you can plug in uh, some of your laptops and stuff like that. Uh, your charges for your cell phone, always, most people carry them in your cars today, but make sure you have enough in your car. And a map with the shelters and important uh, locations. So what can we expect? This is the uh, current forecast for the storms. And as you can see, the average is 12. The prediction this year is 13. And last year, we had 15 storms and so on. So it's pretty much an average season again this year. Uh, but that can change. Now, they always update their forecasts midway through the season, uh, kind of their way out, I guess. But uh, that's what's uh, on tap for us this year, kind of an average season. Here's the names this year, and as you can see, the first one, Andrea, has already crossed off. It was out in the Atlantic a few weeks before the hurricane season started. This is the third year in a row that a hurricane has developed prior to hurricane season starting. But those are the names. I don't know if anybody's name is up there, um, if you're lucky enough or not, but uh, they never have mine up there, so that's a good thing. This next slide I showed you last year, but I want to bring it up again, and I'll show you why. This is the cone. Are we all familiar with the cone, and you can see... In 2008, the blue line, 2012, the green, and 2018, the red. This cone keeps shrinking every few years. The data that the National Hurricane Center is doing is getting better and better every year. They're really becoming very efficient on where the storms are going. This is Hurricane Michael, and why I'm going to talk about this. This went from a tropical storm to a Cat 5 storm in three days. Down here in Cancun is where it developed. 
Before the storm was even a named storm or even on a blip on the map, the National Hurricane Center, and this is what we found out at the Hurricane Conference, the National Hurricane Center called Gulf and Bay counties up on the panhandle to say, listen, we have a system that may be developing down by Cancun. We believe our programs are telling us if this develops, it's going to come up your way. And they were like, well, well there's nothing even on the map yet. But they said, but this is what our data is telling us. Three days later, they had a Cat 5 storm. So that's how good they are getting. So we have to take them seriously today if they tell us that it may be coming our way because the chances are, could be pretty high. And I'm not doing this to scare anybody. This is a storm surge chart. And as you can see, if you're in evacuation A, you can, can expect up to four to eight feet of water and so on, up to E, which is 26 to 29 feet of water. That's a lot of water. This is Mexico City after 20 feet of storm surge. This is not caused by wind. This was caused by water, storm surge. So this is a problem. So what kills people in a storm? It's not the winds. When you shut your eyes and most people think of a storm, hurricane, they think of winds and the problems. Storm water is what we have to be concerned about. As this chart says, 49% of people killed in a storm are, is because of spa water surges. Rain is the next thing. So that's what we really need to be concerned about. Not, not only the wind, you have to be concerned about the wind, but we need to be concerned about water. So when we say you need to go, please take heed to the advice and leave. The water is the problem. Shelters. Two of the shelters closest to us, Tarpon Springs Middle, and the pet, closest pet shelter is Dunedin Middle School. Now, Tarpon Springs shelter out of the middle school is not a special needs shelter, so if you have special needs such as uh, oxygen or any type of electrical stuff that you need to be on because of medical reasons, you'll probably have to go to Dunedin Middle School. And you can contact the department or the county for uh, applications so we can make sure we get you out of here. So make sure you register your pet. Pets have to be registered before they go to a shelter. Uh, you can go to the website up there or call that number and get registered for your pets and they can go to the pet shelter and be taken care of there. But they do not provide food or anything for your pets, so make sure you have enough of that for them. Here's some uh, free apps on your phone that you can put uh, download uh, that will help you out. Alert Pinellas and Ready Pinellas. You can get a lot of information off Ready Pinellas app on your phone. You can find up your evacuation zone. Uh, uh, what's going on in the county as far as emergency management. If you go to the alert Pinellas or the member everbridge.net site there, you can register your phone and you will get alerts from the county either via text message or phone calls and let you know what's going on. I've been getting them just for some of the rainstorms coming through lately to kind of tell us about marine warnings and stuff like that. So it's a great app to have. So know your evacuation zone. That's very important. So you know what you have to do when we tell you it's time. You can do this by uh, going to the automated line uh, phone number there. Uh, your trim notice that you get once a year will have your evacuation zone on it. And there's maps throughout the city, city hall, the library, the fire department, police department. We have uh, evacuation uh, maps and everything else. And it gives you some more information on what you should do and what to bring with you. You can also go to the interactive evacuation map at the county. You, know, you type in your address and you'll get this little chart that comes up and it'll kind of zoom in on your home and tell you exactly what you have uh, evacuation zone is and what you should be doing. So you can follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, city's website, website page and Facebook. Uh, if you like our pages, we always put out information on uh, pages as far as uh, what's going on as, with storms and stuff, trying to keep the public as, uh, up to uh, updated information as much as possible, so uh, you should be able to uh, get what you need from there or from the county. That's pretty much for our presentation. I will be happy to take any questions. Fire right, Chief Young, thank you for the presentation. It's always been very affirmative. Uh, I like Mr. Lecourt. I like to thank our employees for preparing the city for the hurricanes. They're doing an excellent job, and uh, also they're doing a very good job getting ready for the restoration. So we can give my thanks to them. Uh, any commission comment? Commissioner Super. Thank you, Chief Young. Um, I wanted to add, I think the evacuation zones and maps are on our website as well. On the they will be website. on the website if they haven't been. We probably downloading them in there. I think that we put them on there last year. I think we did. Along, I think they put the presentation on there too. Right. Thanks. Commissioner. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Chief, and thank you to the employees uh, that attended the hurricane conference. Um, my only question was actually post storm. I just wanted to make sure that our city was, you know, going going through with the right procedures to make sure that our buildings weren't affected. I know in years past, some of our buildings have been affected by some storms, and we didn't find out till far after the storm had damaged the building. Um, so that's just something I'm not familiar if we have right now. Um, Mr. LaCourus, uh, do we have any protocol in place after a major storm or a named storm to um, inspect a building or inspect yep. any of our municipal buildings? Okay, thank you. Can you detail that a little bit? Just mainly we have our team, our building department, our teams go out there not only, not only again for damage and stuff, but all of our buildings and stuff and uh, the very long, long book that we have of, of things that we can get you a copy of so you can see all the different procedures not only before the storm, preparation, during the storm, after the storm. Um, it's, it's fairly elaborate, so we'd be glad to get that for you to look at and, and review. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to let everybody know that uh, I received an invitation from uh, Senator Scott to attend the conference on uh, June 17th on the hurricane preparedness and recovery. So I'm looking forward to go to that to get any information that will be useful to us. Thank you. Any public comments on this item? Please, if you do come to the podium, state your name and your address for the record. <coughs> Thank you. And all I wanted to know is, do you register your pets now? Or? State your name and your address oh, for the record, please. Um, Jay Neal, uh, 2505 Cypress Pond Road, Palm Harbor. Thank you. Do you register now or yes. do you wait till? No, don't wait till time. No, register your pets now uh, so they get them in the database and stuff like that. So, yep. Thank you very much. Any other comments, questions? Chief Young, thank you very much. We are now going to the uh, consent agenda. Item number four is the minutes for May 14, 2019 regular session. Number five is satisfaction and release of liens. Number six is the award file 190122-AMP-JL, citywide internet and related services. And number seven is the award file number 190125-AND and JL, Never line compliances reporting module. Any items that you like to pull for discussion? Nothing. Any comments? Any commission comments? Here are not any public comments of these items. Items four through seven. Here are none. The uh, chair will detain the motion. <coughs> Second. Second. A roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Terrapani? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? Yes, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the uh, South Spring Boulevard One Way Traffic Study Engineering Analysis Staff Report, Mr. Liquor. Yes, Mr. Robertson will give you an update. Uh, this was an item that uh, came from our work session on May 21st. Um, Mr. Robinson, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. And as Mr. Clor said, this is an item that came from the uh, May 21st Board of Commissioners work session at which staff was asked to prepare a scope of work to conduct a traffic study to evaluate converting South Spring Boulevard into a one-way street. Tonight, we're bringing that forward to, regress, uh, to request the board's recommendation on whether to proceed with that study. Um, the work will be completed by Cardno Engineering, one of the city's engineering consultants. The fee for the study is just under $25,000. The scope of work includes uh, bi-directional traffic counts, turning counts, counts uh, site inventory, trip distribution analysis, level of service analysis, and a summary of findings and recommendations. Analysis of other local streets in the vicinity is also included. Um, this is, of course, only a, a traffic study to provide more data. Approval of this study does not imply your approval of actually converting roads bi-directional at this point. This is merely a data gathering stage or step 
to help in the future decision making process. Uh, that is the summary of this item, and I'll stay at the podium for questions. Thank you. I know that I see a lot of people that are here for this item. They want to uh, speak, so I'd like to go to the uh, public comments first. Any public comments on this item? Good evening, Mayor Alhuzas, Commissioners, and City Manager LaCourse. I apologize for my voice because I have a head cold, so I hope you can understand me. My name is Mary Coburn. My address is 425 South Spring Boulevard, Tarpon Springs. Uh, Mayor Alahuzis, I ask for 10 minutes to speak as Athena Tsardulius, Harry Clemens, and Effie Clemens have yielded their time to me. Yes, you can. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here tonight to urge the Commission to vote against spending $25,000 on something the people of Tarpon Springs don't want. Why would we buy a feasibility study for making South Spring Boulevard and Pineapple Street one way when the people have already spoken on this issue? I have in my hand a copy of the memorandum prepared by Bob Robertson with the survey results done by the city in January 2018. I ask that a copy of them, them be placed in the minutes uh, for tonight's meeting of the city clerk. Uh, do you have a copy to, prov to put in the minutes, or I, I'll just give you my copy when I've finished? Okay. That survey went out to over 100 residents in the area that of Spring Boulevard, South Spring Boulevard, and, Pine and Pineapple Street. And the results are overwhelmingly against making these streets one way. 63% of the residents are against uh, making South Spring Boulevard one way, and 71% were against the Pineapple Street one way. I do understand why the people have clearly rejected this option. A one-way single lane street, as proposed by the city, would create a huge bottleneck at the boat ramp for boaters seeking to launch their boats and those there to pick up their boats. Boat trailers will be lined up waiting to get their chance to launch. Meanwhile, cars will be lined up behind them, unable to pass. Traffic on these roads would constantly be blocked as the postman makes his way down the street delivering the mail and the cars line up behind, unable to pass. Not to mention FedEx, Amazon, and other delivery services. The one way will box in many residents on Pineapple and South Spring who have driveways only in the front yard and no alley access, making every trip from home longer as some will have to go completely around the block to set off for their destination. It will complicate, confuse, and extend response times for emergency services. Every second counts when an ambulance is on the way. Historically, studies have shown traffic speeds increase on one-way streets, and speed is already a problem as cars zoom down South Spring from Banana Street to MLK as there are no stop signs. The Beckett Bridge is scheduled to be shut down in 2020, according to the website as the new bridge is being built, and South Spring will become a major artery for people who live on the west side of the bridge and have to use the Whitcomb Bridge to go to and from their homes. During hurricanes and evacuations and flooding, those streets need to have two-way traffic. In Bob Robertson's memo, the city's proposal shows a photo simulation which depicts pedestrians in the road with traffic. I assume the commission is familiar with this memorandum, all the commission? So the, the picture that I'm talking about, it shows pedestrians in the road with traffic, apparently from Banana Street to MLK. I consider this far more dangerous than what exists right now. It is quite foreseeable that pedestrians will be hit by cars in this setup, and the city is actually inviting them to share the road with cars and trucks hauling boats without protection. The liability for the city is great, especially when Currently, there exists a sidewalk right next to the road for most of the way. Six property owners were able to convince the prior city commission on January 22nd to not install a sidewalk on the city's easement from Lime Street to Lemon Street. I can sympathize with their concerns, but I believe public safety has to take precedence here. Pedestrians are forced to jump into the street from Lime to Lemon Streets on South Spring because there is no linked sidewalk at that point. There's also a dangerous blind curve in that road. Again, it's quite foreseeable that a pedestrian will be struck by a car sooner or later, bringing great heartache and also liability. The simple solution to this problem is for the commission 
to revisit the placement of the sidewalk from Lime Street to Lemon Street. It is the least expensive, most effective, and quickest way to resolve the safety issue. While I sympathize with these six residents, they have no legal standing to object to the sidewalk. The city's easement is right there on their property surveys and deeds. Just like every homeowner in Tarpon Springs, we all have to abide by the laws we all share. And they are fortunate because the city is willing to put in the sidewalk, working around old trees and working with the homeowners as best they can. I've lived on South Spring Boulevard for 50 years. When my husband and I remodeled our home, we had to replace and repair, at our expense, the city's sidewalk in front of our house to get a CO. New construction on homes require the new homeowner to install the sidewalk at their own expense. The city is bending over backwards for these six homeowners. Also, traffic needs to be slowed down on South Spring Boulevard in a double yellow line clearly delineating uh, the double yellow line down the middle, delineating the lanes, um, would go a long way to uh, slowing down traffic, I believe. I'm asking the commission to consider the safety of thousands of pedestrians that are invited by the city into the area during the art show, Epiphany, and other events at Craig Park, and consider the thousands of Tarpon residents who want to enjoy the beauty of the Bayou Walk in safety. As I drive my neighborhood streets, I see near misses on a weekly basis. As a lawyer, I'm concerned that the city's liability has increased exponentially since January 22, 2019, when the sidewalk matter was considered by the city commission, a solution was planned for and presented, and then ultimately rejected, and still nothing's been done to protect the public. The solution is not to create upheaval of 25,000 city residents changing long-used traffic patterns and endangering pedestrians. The solution is simple. Vote to scrap the feasibility study. Then use that $25,000 to install the sidewalk from Lime Street to Lemon Street and start construction as soon as possible. A scenic bayou walkway can be created at the riverbank with the cooperation of the state government and the Army Corps of Engineers to modify the rock pile and extend the shoreline out the 10 feet we've lost due to erosion over the last 50 years. I'm all for it. I would love to be able to kayak from in front of my house once again, but that will take over a million plus dollars and lots of planning and time. Something we will have plenty of after the sidewalk is put in place. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please do not clap, please. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. City Manager, and citizens. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. I saw this on the agenda, and I said, here we go again. Why are we always trying to change our historic districts? You are the keepers of historic Tarpon Springs. Hundreds of years, those roads have been very well and efficiently used. We change our historic uh, uh, face in our community, we lose a lot. Please do not destroy the fruit section or the bayou area with all these new plans you have. It doesn't work. Keep our historic beauty, take care of our historic beauty, and leave it alone. We've been through this before. Why are we continuing it? We have to fight for everything historic in Tarpon to save it and keep it safe. And the time has come that you of our carekeepers of the community have to realize the value of, of the fruit section, the bayou area, and all the historic districts in Tarpon Springs and take care of them instead of trying to make them different like other communities. I can tell you right now, in St. Augustine it was tried and it was changed. You go up there and drive those narrow, narrow streets between all those homes and businesses, they changed it back to the regular. They didn't make the one way. And they knew the value of what they had, and we have to really cherish what we've got here. And in 2020, I hope the city will ask the school board, when the, main, when the bridge is being uh, rebuilt, that they will use Martin Luther King, they will use uh, 
mirrors to get to the school, the school buses, and not come around the bayou area. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like everybody to know that there will be no cheering, no clapping during the prayer meeting, and it's not prayer meeting during a debate, so please do not do that. Thank you. Next person. I'm Steve Boudreau, 307 South Spring. Should people in wheelchairs be in a street with, be in a street with traffic, or on a sidewalk? That answer is simple. Should the street, due to its width, be restricted to a one-way for cars and emergency vehicles? After witnessing a Coca-Cola truck take off the front wheel of a private car, one might think differently. A one-way with restrictions is also fairly a simple answer. This is also related to the bayou traffic. Should the boat dock be restricted to non-motorized launching? Yes. Why? Boats and trailers do not fit on the roads there. And another car on such a small road and a boat trailer passing it is quite an encounter to watch, sometimes turning into the private drives to get by. There's also a lack of parking on the small bayou streets due to the size of the boats and the trailers. There's an abundance of competition for parking at Craig, Craig Park with the rec center, the playground, the bayou walk, and the tennis courts. Surely the city can create another motorized boat launch with adequate parking in a less restricted space and possibly make some nice fees somewhere other than the already crowded bayou. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Hi, I'm Jean Lindsay. I live at 305 South Spring Boulevard. I am one of the six residents that Mary speaks about that lives in that area that is against the sidewalks being in our yard. I'm not saying I'm one way for the one way streets or against it. I do think it's a, uh, a way to solve an issue. The sidewalks through our yard, my house is almost 100 years old. My house is less than, what if they put the sidewalk in, my house will be about 10 feet from the sidewalk, my master bedroom. When I talk, think about safety of people in Tarpon Springs, I also think about my safety probably first. Sorry, it may be selfish, but I do think about it first. And having people 10 feet from my bedroom window walking is something I don't feel safe with. I would like to also, I do think that we should go ahead with the survey to see what the changes are. Does it really um, increase the speed of traffic? I've looked on the internet to see some of these questions to see if I could figure out where that information comes from. I did not find it. The boat traffic, I am a boater. We don't even hardly ever use that ramp because you can't get in and out of it because of two-way traffic. To me, it would be easier if it was one-way traffic and they weren't coming from both directions. Um, the survey that did go out back, um, I guess it was last year, I did try to respond to the survey. I asked some questions that I had um, about the survey. I never did get those questions answered, so I never did vote because I was waiting. It was the first time I've ever tried to vote on anything within the city, but I was trying to figure out how I got my answers. I never did get the answers when I emailed them in. Um, the yard's narrow. There's old trees there. I've surveyed the area myself and I don't understand how we're going to do it without taking down some extremely mature trees that are there or building up a retaining wall in front of our house because our house properties are quite a bit higher than the street is. Um, so I would just like to say I'd like to go forward with the survey, see what it says, let's evaluate it, let's not just throw out one option. We did have a meeting and everybody voted against the sidewalks before. So let's take it forward and just see where this brings us. I'd also like to bring up the fact that we could put the sidewalks on the other side of the road. I know that the Corps of Engineers have worked on that in the past, but 
but I think it would be a solution that would satisfy everybody. So that's my opinion. I thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Any other comments? Costa Vada Kyotas, 538 uh, West Cedar Street, Tarpon Springs. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, I'll make my comments very brief. Uh, this whole matter, as you recall, started with the riprap uh, displacing the open area on the water side of Spring Boulevard. Um, over two years ago, I brought to the attention of the city and actually communicated with the Army Corps for placing a flat sidewalk on the water side of the um, of South Spring Boulevard. That was over two years ago. And this problem has now evolved to a traffic solution trying to solve a sidewalk problem. And it's created a whole lot of issues among the residents where if we would have just bit the bullet two years ago and started then fixing the riprap, we wouldn't be in this boat today. I know you're working diligently to find a solution, but the solution was staring us in the face two years ago, and it's like the old saying goes, um, you're not gonna win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. And so applying for a permit, seeking authorization for the sidewalk, and it doesn't have to be around the entire Whitcomb Bayou, just that section of South Spring Boulevard that doesn't have a sidewalk, just in that area. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? Hi, Tommy Frain, 1671 Autumnwood Street. Uh, back when I lived up here on Penn Street, I used to walk all around town. I'd go walking for like two hours uh, when I was trying to get healthy last year. So and I'd walk down because that's a beautiful view walking down. But the problem is you have to walk in the street. <laughs> and especially at night, it's not the greatest uh, experience when there's cars going pretty fast anyway because at night it's not trafficked very often. So that's how I like to think about if we were to make this a one-way street, would be very similar to when you're down there at night and there's very few cars. And they speed. Um, you know, and actually, just when I was sitting there, I did look up. There's a Penn State study. I'll be happy to email it to you guys about how speed does increase on one-way streets. And that just makes sense because drivers do not feel as if they need to pay as much attention. They know that there's not traffic flow coming the other way. Thinking about putting this, uh, putting the individuals, the pedestrians, on the street um, is a terrible idea. So currently, I, I sit on the Citizens Advisory Council for Forward Pinellas, and and before us came a presentation about Indian Shores, where they're having trouble right now because there is a street that originally uh, it was a street and then just a sidewalk, but it wasn't a sidewalk. It was just people on the street walking with traffic. Now we're having tons of trouble. Uh, you know, they're trying to, now they have to spend millions of dollars to try to figure out problems because we have encroachment on right-of-ways down there. You know, I just see that issue <laughs> 20 years down the road if we were to go forward with this one way. This does not solve the issue. Um, you know, and I feel for the six homeowners, you know, um, I was here that meeting when they came up and spoke and they definitely made, you know, uh, emotional points and I can definitely understand that, not wanting to, you know, but unfortunately, well not unfortunately, I mean, we, we live in an incorporated community. We are a city. You know, we do live by the rules. And there's 25,000 residents, you know, and six homes. I'm very sorry, um, you know, but I, I think riprap, you know, aside, I think the sidewalk should continue on that side of the road, you know, because then you still have people then having to cross the road, go on the water side and then cross back. And, and we have the trouble with the riprap. I mean, that costs, you know, so much money when there's a really simple solution, which is just put the sidewalk, <laughs> buy some houses. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> Any other comments on this item? Here now. Thank you. And now we're going to uh, commission discussion. Commission Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I've been pretty vocal about this area of Tarpon Springs for quite some time. I grew up in this neighborhood. I live just west of this neighborhood off Golf Road as well. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on my bike on this road as a child and as an adult as well. Um, so it, I do know the neighborhood quite well. I, I, um, 
right now I'm not in support of a one-way street in this situation uh, today. I would like the city first to um, follow through with some of the discussions I've had with the city manager and Mr. Robertson about doing a design uh, of a couple options and submitting it to the Army Corps first and seeing how that comes out. And if they say no, then I would be more in favor of a one-way street at that point. But today, I'm not in a favor of a one-way street for even an evaluation standpoint. Uh, just a couple points. If I were in favor of doing an evaluation at this point, I would like to see it during uh, the school year and also during um, probably the spring when we have the most visitors and most of our seasonal residents are here as well. So it gives you a truer picture of what the impact would have in the area. Um, second is it doesn't address the riprap that we have. It's still a safety issue. Um, and that's one of the concerns that I've always brought up is a safety issue on that side of the street. And then third, uh, I do support the sidewalk. I was the only commissioner at the time of the board when the board denied the, the extension of the sidewalk. Um, I was the only one to support the, to put that sidewalk in to address um, the safety concern now while we work on some other design plans for the west side of the road. Um, so those are my thoughts tonight. I'm not going to be able to support this one uh, until we look at... Um, some designs, hopefully we could make uh, some recommendations to go towards the Army Corps and look at that as an area. I think that's the best way to go first. If that doesn't work out, I think the next step would be looking at a one-way street at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Terry Penny was also raised in that neighborhood. I was. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, first, want to make it clear that the commission at our uh, work session did, in fact, ask Mr. Robertson to move forward with this analysis. So there was some uh, comments earlier that spoke to our direction with staff and how we utilize staff and trying not to uh, be a one-legged duck and swim in a circle. So <laughs> I will just for the record say that that was, staff did act at the direction of the commission. Um, that said, you know, I think this issue is kind of multifaceted in the sense that uh, forever and a day we've been talking about the travesty of the riprap project that was done uh, a few years ago and did take some uh, disciplinary actions as a result of that uh, project with uh, our lead building official. Um, that said, it's, it's a multi, it's, it's a multifaceted issue. One is the safety of, of our residents and the safety of pedestrians as they walk around, you know, one of the most beautiful landscape vistas uh, that we have, waterfront vistas that we have in town. So first and foremost, I would be in favor of uh, the simple approach, the common sense approach, which is to put the sidewalk in. And, you know, certainly I can, uh, feel with with Miss Lindsay. I've lived in a historic house before and had you know people ten feet from my uh, master bedroom door. Or master bedroom happened to me when I lived on uh, Reed Street. So I sympathize with that, um, but I also believe that uh, it's probably the easiest way to rectify the problem while we continue to look for more long-term solutions as it relates to the riprap. Whether it's continued discussions with the Army Corps of Engineer uh, engineers or uh, further community outreach uh, and input, gathering input as it relates to surveying uh, potentially a one-way street. Um, I'll tell you that uh, as we look to try and rectify the wrong, um, I'm open to the one-way street, uh, but only if necessary. Ultimately, if we can't do anything with the riprap and nothing can be redone uh, that makes sense in terms of dollars and cents, uh, I'm open to the idea, but I won't be able to uh, further support it until more uh, evaluation or more analysis has been done uh, within the community. So, you know, while, I'm, while I was open to it and still am, I don't necessarily think that right now, uh, this quickly, it's wise to spend the $25,000. I think we should put that towards the sidewalks uh, and then potentially do some more surveying of our residents, more a broader base to begin with, uh, not just the people that live directly in that neighborhood, but um, uh, Tarpon Springs as a whole. <laughs> So I don't know how we do that. I mean, what's the most co cost-effective way to do that? Is it, is it put it in the water bill? Um, you know, then it's a matter of you can, you can serve everybody and you can give everybody the opportunity to respond. Uh, you know, obviously you're not going to get 25,000 people to respond, but it'll be a broader base than possibly what was surveyed before. Um, so I don't know if we need to uh, put it on an upcoming agenda to do the sidewalk or, or take a vote on the actual sidewalk tonight. Um, but I do think that first and foremost needs to happen uh, right away as a safety, public safety concern. And then we can look towards uh, creating a new landscape vista in the future, whether it's uh, further communication with the Army Corps 
or possibly looking at uh, get, you know, taking some more land from other places, whether it be one way or, or not. But uh, tonight I'm not in for spending 25 grand. Thank you. Thank you. Commission Siever. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, a very passionate situation. I live on South Spring, <laughs> so I'm one of the people that sees the traffic, sees the, the congestion, the boats, the speeding, the buses going by, and I fear for someone's life every time I you know, go around the bayou myself because uh, I go off the curb when I'm in the truck because it's, it's just not enough room. Um, I understand that one way could cause issues with people. Um, I use actually South Spring. I don't have the I have the alley behind my house, but I don't use the alley. <clears throat> so I am one of the ones that would be affected by the one way. But if that's what we decided on, I would I would go with it. Um, as far as evaluating the other side, and and excuse me, Bob. I know we directed you. <laughs> To, to go out and, and uh, do this analysis. And um, now we're coming back and saying no, I think, uh, according to my uh, colleagues here. Um, and Mr. Vadikotis has mentioned, and you know, I've been talking about this since I got on the board, uh, looking at the east side, I mean the west side of the street, uh, and what can be done. Um, I'm almost ready at this point to say, let's look at that. Uh, not the sidewalks right now, and not do sidewalks, and, and then you know say something can be done on the on the west side after we've put sidewalks through uh, these six people's uh, yards. Uh, but you know maybe reach out to the Army Corps, do the analysis, and figure out what can be done on the on the west side because obviously it's been an issue for people since since it was put in, and it is dangerous. And and I'd still like to see if there's a possibility for us to do something. I know you had mentioned it could cost $100,000 to do the, or even more to, um, to do a study, but I would like to just reach out to the Corps somehow, maybe without spending that $100,000, uh, and see what the feasibility is for us. And I, I know the whole reason that that was done is that, you know, the street is, was in danger of sinking in. So, you know, having more traffic and buses and cars and and boats that are a lot larger than they used to be um, concerns me too. But um, maybe we need to look at that again because uh, I think we're not getting very far with the one-way situation, which was actually one of my neighbors, uh, former neighbor's suggestions, uh, Jeff, uh, who came to me and asked me to look into that uh, possibility. So um, I, I guess we're just not going to move forward unless the board disagrees with that, uh, with the, your feasibility side. Although I, I, I think that it should be done because, um, you know, twenty-four thousand dollars is not a huge amount of money to spend uh, to see what the study would say. But I'll go with my colleagues if we don't want to do the study. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioners, and all the public comments. Um, good to see a lot of public comment on this issue. I believe that converting South Spring to a one-way would be a mistake. Um, the public had a lot of good comments. The commission had a lot of good comments. So I won't get too too detailed into why. Um, you know, it'd hinder accessibility of the boat ramp. It'd redefine a historic area of town. It'd slow down emergency personnel, creating a liability issue for the city. And overall, I just don't think it's necessary. Uh, and I don't think the community support is there for converting it to a one-way. And I don't think we need $25,000 to tell us that. Um, that being said, I would support seeing the sidewalks connected. So again, um, if that's something that we were we would be able to do tonight, or if uh, maybe on a possible future agenda item, that's something I'd like to see done. Uh, but in, in terms of the one way, no, I would not be in support of making South Spring a one way or the uh, data collection for it. But thank you, Mr. Robinson, for for bringing this forward, and thank you again for the public comment on this. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, again, I want to thank you for all the work you do. And yes, it was our direction to, uh, we ask you to look and see what's going to cost for another survey. And of course, we got our, our answer back that, that we'll need to spend $25,000 for another traffic study to convert the South Spring Boulevard one way and to have the uh, sidewalk in, in the street. So you're going to have a traffic right next to the people that are walking. To me, I think it's unsafe to do that. Um, I sympathize with Mrs. Reeves that if we connect the sidewalks on the uh, w on the east side of the road, 
she's only going to have 10 feet uh, front yard. Well, on Hope Street, m they just built sidewalks there. In my house, it has less than 10 feet. So this is the way it is. We have to provide sidewalks because it is a safety to the people of Tarpa Spring. We do that on a, on a public area. Uh, which is uh, it's an easement which is belong to the city and we must provide safety to the people. Um, but I do sympathize not having all the yard that you want to have. Um, it was a question and it was a concern about the trees that were there. Well, you see many sidewalks that are not straight. They go around the trees so they don't damage the, uh, uh, damage the trees. So I, I don't see that to be an issue there. But uh, I cannot justify to spend $25,000 for another survey. We already have a survey, and the, the answer that we got from the people is that don't want the street to be one way. Um, my first option, to me, my first option will be to build a sidewalk on the, on the west side of the, uh, of the Spring Boulevard so that people can actually walk and enjoy the water. But after talking to uh, Mr. Robinson, the other price tag for that is going to be over a million dollars for the sidewalk. But we can't wait any longer. We must provide safety to the pedestrians. So uh, my second option is to build and to connect the existing sidewalk on the east side of South Spring Boulevard and to provide safety to the people of Tarpa Spring. And this is what I'm going to support. Any, uh, any other comment? If not, I'm looking for a motion. Uh, I've got a motion to, um, sorry, to deny, um, to deny this uh, South Spring Boulevard one-way traffic study um, with the following recommendations to coming back to the board. Uh, one would be to bring back to the board the um, agenda item that was denied uh, by the previous board for the sidewalk to be um, connected on the east side of South Spring Boulevard. And then I would like to direct staff and the city manager to move forward with designs of the design options for the first phase um, of the Spring Boulevard that would cover up the riprap of some other options that we could present to the Army Corps of Engineers. Commissioner Carr, you can make a decision today if you want to connect the sidewalk, in my opinion. Can I have clarity on that? I would That's I would step. defer to say turn this item is about That's this step. item wasn't advertised oh. or anything. It's like this advert was advertised about the one way road. Let's see what the attorney has to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Commissioners, um th this is not a quasi judicial question such that by law you are required to provide notice. It's it's on the books, the the law on sidewalks and connectivity and so forth's on the books. The mayor is correct that the the, the uh, right of way is already owned. Um, so whether the commission makes goes it goes ahead and proceeds tonight to instruct the administration to proceed, or whether it instructs the administration to put it on a follow up agenda, uh, so that the six people who came last time and and got you to say no that we'll try can try again, that's a matter of you know, courtesy if you want to do that. But but there is no legal reason that notice is required. You can make the decision tonight legally. The other reason I would say is when we bring those two options back to you, right now we've only got money budgeted to do one of them. So if we were going to do a study, and again, we need to firm that up, get a firmer price for you um, in going back and getting the option of what we need to do to design of a portion of it. Um, it's probably going to be about the exact price of doing the sidewalk. So as far as funding goes, there would be only funding for you to decide to do one right now unless we decided to get funding something else. So what do we do with the funding from the trailhead that we looked at um, to extend north of North Tarpon Springs? There's like $300,000, I believe, that was budgeted this year. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also some um, opportunities for the safer grant or some, some firefighter side that um, it was like $300,000, I believe, too. I think last budget season we talked about if some of these items were delayed, we could use these funds for the design aspect of South Spring Boulevard. Um, so I think that's an opportunity well, to again, look at that, some it, of these areas. And if that's we what I'm saying. If we push to next year's budget, then we can use some of these other funds that are already that we have already um, for those areas. 
Yeah, that's why I'm saying I'd have to bring you back a funding because there, there'd be really only funding to do one of those things unless I came back to you with some additional funding from somewhere else to do that. Okay. Do, you, so, do we know approximately what's going to cost to uh, construct and do a uh, connect the sidewalk from the uh, east side of uh, South I believe it was about $90,000. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Cause sidewalk, the, the cost, the, to do the sidewalk on the other side. It was about 90000 yes, sir. The east side sidewalk, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, on your side. Yeah, so that's ninety thousand, and we have that already. Budgeted. And again, before the rough, yes, before the you know the rough estimate, which we'd have to go back and confirm and bring back to you for doing the study for the portion on the water side of it is probably approximately was when the report was done approximately a hundred thousand dollars the same amount. So that's where we stand right now with that. Mayor, okay. yes. well, he's still talking. Oh, I'm sorry. He's still talking. Okay. Thing. Okay. With further discussion, I would update my motion to approve this connectivity of the sidewalk um, and then also direct staff to come back to the board with ideas and costs to design additional um, sidewalks on the west side of the uh, South Spring Boulevard. Okay. I need a, do we have a second? No, second. I, I just wanted to say something. Yeah, I have a second. Uh, discussion there. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I thought that the agenda item was about saying whether we should move forward uh, with the, the one way and uh, the feasibility study, uh, not the sidewalk tonight. I think that we really need to know more about what we can do on the west side before we go putting in sidewalks on the east side. Without knowing that answer, I don't feel right about doing the sidewalks or connecting the sidewalks on, on, the, on the east side. Any other comments? <coughs> need some clarity on the motion. Uh, so, Commissioner, the motion is to, first and foremost, deny the feasibility study as it relates to traffic. Second, move forward with the connectivity of the uh, sidewalk in between Lime and Lemon. Uh, and then direct staff to come back with some design ideas for the east side of? West side. West side. Or, sorry, the west side? <laughs> yeah, the west side um, that we could present to the Army Corps, see Great. if they would approve or not. Uh, I just want to add, if we approve this tonight regarding the sidewalks that we uh, take into consideration some of the uh, mature live oak trees or some of the mature oak trees and just make sure that we do what we can to try and create a, an area around them without that tree removal. Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. That's always been the problem. Yeah. Uh, we still have the second, right? <coughs> Any other comments on the second? Roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? No. Vice Mayor Chair Penny? Yes. Mayor Allen, who's this? Yes. Thank you. No, we already finished that. Thank you very much. We're now going to the next item. Item number nine is a settlement of, uh, settlement of court enforcement and at the uh, 1330 Belcher Drive. City Attorney, if you please present this item. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Commissioners, um, you all have in your agenda packet uh, Mr. Trask's uh, memo. This is to settle a uh, code enforcement lien. The current amount owed is a little over $22,300. Uh, the bank has agreed to uh, an amount of $15,000, which Mr. Trask uh, and I feel uh, is a very uh, good and, and fair amount of money for the city. This is a, a bank-owned property. Uh, it has uh, been rehabilitated, and uh, the, the code enforcement issues are, are now done. And so with this action, the bank will be able to finally put it back in the private sector and, and let some folks get living in it. Thank you. Any commission comments? Vice Mayor. Mr. LaCourse, where does this settlement money go in terms of general fund, fund. the general fund? Yeah. Do we have a... Uh, I know uh, Commissioner Donovan has been working closely with the budget in terms of like year to date stuff. Uh, do we have a line item that can tell us year to date or at certain date how much money we've collected in terms That's of? Mr. Herring, hear that for you anytime you want it. Okay, great. Are there any restrictions on how we spend that money? No. Thank you. Any other comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Here, none. I will detain a motion. Move to approve. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Chair Penny? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Yes, thank you.
We are now going to uh, item number 10, which is the ordinance 2019-50, five fire suspension trust fund uh, amendment. This is the first reading. Sierra Attorney, if you please read the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a first reading by title only of ordinance number 2019-15, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, further amending the city of Tarpon Springs firefighters pension trust fund adopted, adopted pursuant to ordinance number 2000-18 as subsequently amended. Amending section one, definitions by amending the definitions of credited service, firefighter, and spouse. Amending section two, membership. Amending section four, finances and fund management. Amending section eight, disability. Amending section 15, maximum pension. Amending section 17, miscellaneous provisions. Amending section 25, Deferred Retirement Option Plan, adding Section 28, Supplemental Benefit Component for Special Benefits, Chapter 175 Share Accounts, providing for codification, providing for severability of provisions, repealing all ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. Uh, this ordinance uh, is going to have a second reading on June 25th, 2019, and was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on June 14th, 2019. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. This is to comply with the recent changes of the stay in federal law, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Chief, Chief report. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Chief, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, again, and just I'll turn it over to them, but again, all these changes in the pension, you did this for the police probably five months ago. You did it a while ago for the police, and these are all statutory changes. Um, and again, they've been looked at by the pension board and the pension attorney. We've also had them looked by a pension attorney that represents the city to look at. And uh, again, these are all required by statute, so we want to be up to statute. And I'll turn it over to, to Scott and, and our pension board uh, chairman. Good evening, Chief Young, Tarp Springs Fire. Uh, as Mr. LaCourse said, these are all uh, brought to you to put the plan in compliance with federal and Florida state statutes. Uh, uh, required by uh, the law. So we'll be hey, happy to answer your questions uh, if you have any. Uh, with me is uh, Jim Mariani, he's the chairman of the uh, Firefighters Pension Board. Jim, you want to say something? No, sir. Okay. <laughs> Vice Mayor Terrapin. I was just going to ask you if you're good with it, Chief. All yes, good. we're good with it. We, uh, like I like said, this, they went to uh, two attorneys, pension attorneys, they both agreed. They talked, we had meetings, and they both confirmed that these changes are good for the plan. Good enough for the chief, good for me. Any permission to comment, question? Any public comments on this item? Here none, I will gain a motion. So move. Second. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Siebert? Yes. Vice Mayor Tierpani? Yes. Mayor LaHousis? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next is item number 11, the application 18-177 for uh, Caliber Collision, U.S. 19, and River Watch Boulevard. It, that was deferred from May 28, 2019. Item uh, 11A and, and item 11B are related. will be discussed together, but we're, well, we're going to vote separately. Uh, item number uh, 11B is quasi-judicial. The uh, city attorney will read the title and he will explain the quasi-traditional process. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I'm going to, and, and if uh, the, unless the commission objects, I'm going to read both the titles of both ordinances since they are related. So the first is Ordinance 2019-10, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map for approximately 2.28 acres of property located along the east side of U.S. Highway 19, north, approximately 427 feet north of River Watch Boulevard, uh, application 18-177, from R-OR, Residential Office Retail, to IG, Industrial General, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Ordinance 2019-10, uh, uh, the second reading thereof will be after a uh, Pinellas County review, so it is to be determined. Uh, and this ordinance was t uh, published by title uh, by by title with map uh, in the Tampa Bay Times on May the third, twenty nineteen. Ordinance twenty nineteen eleven, 
an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida for approximately 2.28 acres of property located along the east side of U.S. Highway 19 North, approximately 427 feet north of River Watch Boulevard, application 18-177, from zoning designation CPD, Commercial Plan Development District, to zoning designation IPD, Industrial Plan Development District, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Ordinance 2019-11 will have its second reading also after county review. Uh, and it was published uh, by title with map in the Tampa Bay Times on May 3rd, 2019. Uh, I will now review for the folks in the audience uh, who may wish to participate uh, the, the city's quasi-judicial procedures that need to be followed. Um, the, uh, this is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applica applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. There is an established procedure which will be followed at this quasi-judicial hearing. All witnesses must give their testimony under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name and address for the record. All testimony questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the issues under consideration. The city staff will present its testimony and evidence first. The applicant will then have an opportunity to cross-examine the city staff. The applicant will then present the testimony, uh, its testimony and witnesses. The city staff will have an opportunity to cross-examine the applicant's witnesses. Members of the public opposing the application will then be given an opportunity to present testimony. After all members of the public speaking in opposition to the application have concluded, members of the public in support of the application will have an opportunity to present testimony. Each member of the public is limited to four minutes of testimony. The applicant will then have an opportunity to make a closing argument or summary, after which the city staff will, will be given an opportunity to make a closing argument or summary. Following this, the board will consider the matter. Um, the board members may ask questions of witnesses at this point in, in the proceedings, and a motion will eventually be made and a vote will be taken. Uh, Mr. Mayor, unless there are any disclosures of ex parte <coughs> communications or conflicts of interest by members of the commission, uh, it will be time now to swear in all the witnesses. So if you would please, uh, anyone who wishes to uh, testify in this proceeding, provide testimony in this proceeding, uh, please raise your right hand and repeat after me, I do, I do swear or affirm that the testimony uh, that I am about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mr. Mayor, so it's now time for a staff's presentation. Good evening, Heather Erler, um, Planning and Zoning Director and staff to this particular application. Um, this application is uh, essentially a future land use amendment and a rezoning um, of an existing planned development um, project that has somewhat stalled in the past. Um, essentially attached to the zoning approval is also a preliminary master plan, which is updating the original master plan for this particular um, project. So what's included here, um, again, is a change in the future land use category from um, 
RO, ROR, which is residential office retail, um, to the um, industrial general category to allow for industrial uh, uses. And then you have an accompanying zoning amendment from the CPD to IPD. Um, the reason why this is coming forward with um, a change in the use, uh, land use, is because uh, collision centers in your code are identified as industrial uses. So as a result of them being um, identified as industrial uses, in order for this applicant to move forward with this, this project, they have to amend the future land use and they have to amend the zoning. Along with that, they've included their preliminary master plan, which is required by your code, um, to show that they are demonstrating essentially that they are compliant with the land development code requirements. There is a further step that will come after we go through this process, should they be successful, where the final development plan will come before you as well. Um, with that, this is a 2.28 uh, acre site. Um, it's adjacent to the existing Northern Tools site for those who are familiar with that site. Um, it's also adjacent um, to the River Watch community. Um, this is a master planned um, uh, subdivision essentially. It's a commercial subdivision. And essentially, they have, which means they have master drainage, they have master access. Um, their parking isn't a master um, plan. However, there was a master parking plan originally done for the project. So they have um, s demonstrated through their uh, analysis that with the reduction in, uh, with the reduction in trips for this particular facility, because it's an industrial facility, when the trip drive generation rate was done for the entire plaza, it was done at, for commercial retail uses. So uh, it was a mixed use. And again, this isn't uncommon to have a mixing of uses in a PD. It's actually very common. Um, generally, you will see a mixing of all kinds of variety of different uses within, um, within a PD. So it's not surprising to actually have um, two different zoning and two different land uses in a PD district. It's very common. Um, it's not so common in Tarpon because we don't do a lot of PDs in Tarpon. Um, but it's very common outside this community. Um, with that, this application has been found to be um, deemed consistent with both your comprehensive plan and your land development code. They've met the criteria necessary to move forward for um, uh, change in uh, the future land use amendment uh, in the comp plan, and they've made the, the because of their plan, they've made consistent effort to provide detailed analysis to prove that they are consistent with all of your provisions for development in the land development code. So with that, staff is recommending approval of both of these applications. Um, this did go forward through the technical review team and the comment, their comments are listed in your packet. Um, most of what what you see in there has been resolved. What hasn't been resolved will be resolved by final development plan. Um, some of these comments that we get at technical review team are actually more of future development comments so that the they know exactly what they're going to have to meet um, when they get to the end of the project. With that, um, the Planning and Zoning Board did review this application on May 20th. At that particular board um, hearing, there was only four members present. Um, that's a seven member board, but unfortunately only four were able to attend. Um, with that, basically it was a split decision. So because it was two for and two against, the application essentially is a, it's a recommendation of denial. The, the motion fails for lack of, a, lack of um, uh, enough member, uh, enough affirmative votes. So as a result, um, while staff is recommending approval, the planning board did deny this application um, as a result of their split vote. And with that, I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Attorney, I have a question to ask. Yes, Ms. Mayor. Uh, Heather, I want to thank you for spending the time in discussing this with me the other day. Uh, the question that I have is the, uh, the existing zoning right now on the north, south, and west of the property is residential office retail. On the east side is residential orbit. If we change this zoning, are we creating a uh, spot zoning? No, we're not creating spot zoning. Again, this is a planned development. Your, the categories that you're dealing with here um, for your land use is we're trying to make them consistent within the uses that are allowed for them to move forward with this project. However, this is not spot zoning. It is not uncommon in the PD process to have multiple different land use categories working and functioning together. The adjacent use to this use is a, is a, is a, is a tool 
is, a, is basically like a Home Depot, all right, for, for tools, for larger, for larger tools. Um, so it's a very similar type use. This is a self-contained um, automotive use. Um, I don't see any issue. There are lots of communities that have these that are allowed in their commercial uses. They're allowed within their commercial categories. If you are in that, in that particular, in a community that allows it in the commercial categories, therefore, they wouldn't be coming forward to you. They'd be coming, they bring you their development plan. That's all they would bring is their, their site plan for it because they'd be consistent. So this particular use, we're not talking about manufacturing. We're not talking about industrial uses that are inconsistent. Because you have a master plan here that controls the specific use that this is going to be used for, um, I have very little concern that you're not going to get a collision center here. Um, and a collision center is very common in the types of highway business uses that you have along highways. So it's not unco an uncommon thing to see in other communities for that to be on a corridor. It's a completely self-contained um, use, which you, they'll talk to you a little bit about how their process works. They brought a lot of information on how the facilities have changed. Automotive, has cha automotive um, repair has changed drastically over the last 10 to 15 years. It's completely self-contained. It's all system-based where it goes from one stage to another stage to another stage, and then they're out the door in a fairly short amount of time. Matter of fact, all the insurance adjusting and everything is really done by this particular company. So it's a really self-contained industry where it used to be people were coming in and out and it was a different, it was a different world. So I have, I have limited concerns with this because of the fact that we have master drainage on the property, because we've already crossed, we're, we're doing cross connections for the existing site that's there and for future development that, that will be on the balance of the site. So I don't see um, any concern with this being specifically an industrial use, it's just what your code is. When we go through your land development code update, this may be a use that we actually recommend to you moving out of the industrial uses and moving into the like a heavy commercial use. Um, if that was the case in your code, then that's what we would be, we would be applying, but it's not the case in your code right now. And on behalf of the city attorney's office, I was aware that this question was out there uh, in the community about spot zoning and I did thoroughly research it before I came and, and, and I, it's against ethical lawyer rules to, to guarantee an outcome, but just short of guaranteeing an outcome, I'm very, very, very confident that this is, would not be spot zoning. Okay. More questions? Okay. Uh, can you, you uh, detailed an email back to me about a bunch of the case, um, cases, and you also referred to it as uh, potentially a reverse spot zoning. Can you touch on that a little bit more? And well, reverse spot zoning is where you've been allowing, let's say there's a, a line of properties that, uh, St. Petersburg has this a lot, where uh, they used to be homes, but because everything has grown up and, and uh, traffic and the roads are widened, they're really not viable homes anymore. And so the city let uh, home A, home B, home D, and home E rezone to be commercial shops or whatever, and then the home C right in the middle comes forward and says, well, I want that too because, you know, nobody's going to live there. It's too too busy traffic. And the city says, no, that that's an, ex an easy example of reverse spot zoning where you've given it to everybody else that's surrounding it, but you don't give it to them. This really isn't a case of reverse spot zoning. It, the, the, I think the concern from the community that I heard was was normal spot zoning, which is that you, you give a, a landowner something better, more intensity or density than the other um, uh, properties around it, and it's inconsistent with your, your long-range comprehensive planning, that's not what's occurring here. I've got a question for staff. Is this a time to ask? Okay. Uh, Heather, in the IPT, IPD district, uh, it's page 14 in our backup. Uh, it says design standards, minimum project size equals 20 acres. Mm -hmm. Can you help me understand that with this project? Because I believe it says it's two point two. So when we do when we do PDs, that's that's in talking about PD standards. When we do PDs, it's looked over the entire the entire the entire property. So it's over that entire existing property. And because you're dealing with an existing PD, um, this is a modification of that PD. So if the PD itself doesn't meet the standards, it was decided at a previous time that that PD was a legitimate use of the property. And we're just looking to allow for this modification for this particular portion of, this, of the site. 
So the limitations that are in the code, how we've read that is it's consistent with that section of, of the comprehensive plan because we're dealing with an existing condition, right? We're dealing with an existing PD and a modification within that existing PD. Even though the whole, am I, am I right in saying the whole PD isn't being the Where whole PD is not being adjusted here. It's just the it's just the it's just this two point um, two eight acre section. Okay. Um, I guess city attorney, does this fall within? Yeah, I, I didn't really plan to ask you this question, but um, what city staff has said with the design standards of the minimum project of twenty acres, does that fall within the, the jurisdiction of the law in that aspect from zoning? Um, Commissioner, I'm not exactly sure I'm understanding your question. So in the design standards, it says the minimum project size should be 20 acres, and then the project size within this PD that um, city staff has presented is only 2.2 acres. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're not missing something here. Well, I see what, yeah, I see what you're saying. No, I, I think uh, Heather can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would read that as the, the entire PD not not just this particular part of it is that your in this particular case because you're dealing with that with a modification rather than establishing a brand new PD we looked at this standard and we said okay well this is consistent within the within the IG category even though it's should be that way it's not a mandatory has to be that way it what it is is you don't want to create um, industrial property that can't self-sustain itself. That's the reason why you look for that 20 acre because most industry needs large parcels for them to be viable because you're usually dealing with park development when you're dealing with that IG category because that's your heavy industrial category. So that's the reason why that threshold is there. Now we've reviewed this with, um, we reviewed this, uh, actually the applicant and I went down and reviewed this with Ford Pinellas to, to talk to them specifically with their design categories as well because they are gonna need a map amendment down at the county. And this was the, the path that we chose together collectively because we thought it was the most appropriate path okay. because of the fact you're dealing with that PD. Now if we, we wouldn't be doing this if we were not, if we didn't have that PD to deal with. Okay. We'd be trying something different. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just had a couple of things that I noted in the staff report that I think uh, are worth mentioning, and I'm, I'm sure Heather already mentioned them. Um, one, one thing I noted in terms of the public correspondence, just out of curiosity, I see that it was only within 200 feet. Is that because it was done so, notification was done so prior to our amendment of that? It was done prior to your amendment, correct. Um, did the applicant share with you, I'm sure they could answer this themselves, but since you're up there, how much, uh, how many jobs will be created? You'd have to ask them directly. All right. Vice Mayor Vanden. Yeah, I understand. Uh, and then also noted, uh, you have a reduction in terms of some of your analysis. You say that there will actually, going to this new zoning, there'll be a reduction in the amount of traffic trips. That's, that's true, yeah. Usually commercial generates a higher traffic rate because you have more trips coming back and forth where an industrial doesn't have that same situation. This particular industrial category, it's like they go there and they stay there for a period of time, so the trips are counted a little bit differently. They're actually discounted because of the way that the traffic is actually generated. Thank you. And then also it was noted that there's an eight-foot wall uh, that's already existing separating this, or not separating, but acting as a buffer in between this project and the uh, residential neighborhood, is that correct? That's correct. And that surrounds the whole property? That's, yeah, it runs the whole length of this property on the back. It doesn't actually come up to the, the wall. It goes actually back to the subdivision because it's a subdivision's wall. Gotcha. Uh, and you noted that with the restrictions in this industrial use that the activity uh, is only allowed indoors, correct? Correct. Um, and then I just thought that it was uh, of value to mention you said within our code that this type of use falls within a light industrial category, correct? Correct. And that within other areas, it would just be more of a heavy commercial? Correct. And I just thought, okay, well, where is an example within this community that we have another auto body shop? Um, and the only one that I can think of would be the one that exists uh, at Furman Chevrolet. And I just thought of the surrounding area around that auto body shop. And you have Brittany Park, which is, uh, you live there, right, Commissioner? Yes. Brittany Park. So, I mean, Brittany Park is adjacent to it and it's existing light industrial use. So I mean, in terms of compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods, I, I don't think that there is uh, much of an issue there. Um, that's all I have for now, thank you. 
Yes, thanks, uh, Heather. I think I read in the backup there are 20 to 25 teammates that they're uh, going to be hiring. Is that correct? Uh, I can answer job. that question. <clears throat> uh, and, and I think 40% of them would be local, uh, according to what this backup we got today which I'm thankful for because it, all, it had a lot of information. That yeah, that's that came from the applicant. That's their, that's part of the slideshow that you'll, yes. that they're going to provide you. Uh, because I also um, appreciate the eight foot wall, the buffering, uh, the trees, uh, because this is a, a neighborhood uh, next to them. But this being self-contained um, and s some of the technological advances that they list here, um, as far as capturing a 98% of the particulates, uh, changing filters every two weeks, uh, the paint and, and all these other, um, you know, that they're not law uh, that they have to abide by um, is, is very impressive. And, and I think it's one of the largest um, maintenance uh, facilities in, in the country. So um, I feel that they have the safety of, of uh, the people in mind um, and, uh, I, I like what they're doing. We still have to have the site plan come back in front of us. Is that correct? That's correct. You're going to have a final development plan. So we will be seeing it again <clears throat> before uh, it goes for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for presenting this. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity new jobs coming to Tarpon Springs, especially a unique one that we might lack right now. Uh, but I did have a few questions. Uh, on the application for major modification page two, I believe it is, um, the endangered species study and hurricane study are left blank and it says um, only if required. So they're not required in this situation? It was a completely cleared site at this point. There's not the endangered species issues here mm -hmm. that we have on most sites because it's a previously developed site. Um, so that was not required and hurricane evacuation is not required for commercial development. There is no evacuation. It would be for residential. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure that wasn't required. I know <laughs> there's the pond. There's the pond that's right by there. I, I drive by it a lot. Um, so did they have to take any environmental precautions at this point in terms of tests, inspections, or anything like that? Not, not, for, a mo not for the size modification, no. Okay. And then I also just wanted to um, make it clear that the noise and lighting affecting the residential neighborhoods concerns me. I'm sure in your packets you all got the emails um, towards the Anderson Residence of River Watch, and that's a legitimate concern. I, I know a lot of the noise will be, you know, during the daytime, even if it is an auto body shop. I mean, you got US 19 right there. So the noise concerns me a little bit less than the lighting does. But I believe they said it'd be from 7 to 6, right? That's what that's their operating Correct. Hours. And we're talking about them opening bays and removing cars. It's really no different than somebody turning on the car at their at their in the parking lot of Northern Tool adjacent to it. I mean, the the amount of vibration and noise that you're going to receive is the same as you would have you're going to have on the adjacent site. They're not having heavy equipment out here. You might have a truck move through there to, that's dropping off cars or that type of thing if they need to, if they have a wrecker or something like that. But that's the type of noise we're talking about. You can have the same thing in a parking lot at a commercial thing. My car breaks down, I got to call a wrecker. So. Okay. And do you know in terms of the security lighting that'll be lit up at night? I know I live in Brittany Park. Tarpon Trace is a little bit closer to, um, you know, the, the auto body stuff that goes on there right now. But their security lighting is really well done in that it, it strictly faces the road. And we would have there. them direct what we have a condition and it will actually come on your master development plan. That's the condition that, that we put on most of these. You don't get it at a preliminary development plan. It, it comes when we get to that final stage. And that's that we have them direct to the light shield, directed inter, internal to the site and shielded. So they'll have to have shielded lighting. Okay. So it, it basically has shields over top of it so it directs it into the light because we also don't want light spill onto the 19 because that can be distracting for drivers. Okay. As you probably know, because it's very good distracting driving up there with all the car dealerships. Yeah. Because they like to put light in. Okay. And then just my last comment on it is that um, there's several emails here. Uh, one from Evelyn Connor, uh, Elizabeth Franco. Just concerned citizens that were reaching out regarding a future potential project. And I'm glad that they were in our backup. I'm glad that I got to see them. But possibly in the future, I'd like to get forward to those emails when they're sent. Because um, I think a couple of these emails were sent like May 12th, May 14th, May 16th. And I know they don't directly, you know, direct the commission, but it says to whom this may concern. And if a, if a citizen's, you know, just reaching out to their city government regarding a future project that's going to be on the agenda eventually, even though it may not directly address them or be emailed to the BOC, 
um, I'd like to be forwarded them at that time because I, I never got forwarded any of these emails, and I'm glad that I'm seeing them now. Um, but just in the future, that might be something to consider is, is forwarding those emails right away to the commission. Thank you. We'll, we'll have a future discussion. We'll, we'll talk about that because it could be an issue, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, and at, Mr. Mayor, just to, to really quickly address that, um, you, you should probably have a conversation with Mr. Tress because yeah. it, it's a quasi-judicial yeah. issue. And yes, so, right. you know, normally that kind of input, yeah, you're an elected official, but because it's quasi-judicial, the record is what you've got to make a decision on. And so it, it, Mr. Trask may have a concern, I know I would, about some of you seeing stuff early and going and researching it outside of this meeting or whatever. So, Especially you know. because planning board at that point hadn't seen, hadn't even seen that packet. And a lot of those come in prior to the planning board process. So even the land, even the land, um, the planning board hasn't reviewed it at that point. So that's why you're seeing them that their later dates is because they came in at the time of planning board. And it's not uncommon for the co correspondence to start during that. And some folks don't necessarily, they just assume that we're going to do that, which we always put it in the backup for you guys if we get stuff from the, from the thing. But I don't, we can talk to, um, to uh, Tom and see how he feels about that. But I mean, it's not a problem. It's just usually we don't get them until we get the get to the planning board portion of the hearing. Okay, so schedule. just to clarify, if it wasn't you know, a quasi-judicial hearing, then we would have received them even though they weren't addressed to the BOC? We would have been forwarded them? Or like if this was yeah. another agenda item? Yeah. Okay. Because it's project specific in this case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Heather, I have one more question before we go to the applicant's presentation. Uh, the planning zoning board was 32. Do you know what concerns they have if and if their concerns have been addressed? Um, the planning board's concerns were some of the, they shared some of the concerns that the residents um, expressed. Um, that's what some of, that's what split the vote was they were concerned about some of the, con the concerns. Um, staff feels that the applicant has demonstrated um, that they're going to meet that those criteria. They're reducing their traffic numbers. Um, the applicant, I believe, has their design professionals here tonight, so they can speak to the traffic study and, and the things that they've done, the analysis that they've done. But we don't feel that there, those issues are going to be a problem. Some of the issues that came up dealing with flooding and that type of thing. This is a master drained community. Their community. This this plaza is master drainage so it's not going to affect the drainage on the other side of the wall because it's got an existing drainage pond um, so they are they are within that framework we still haven't built out this entire site so there is plenty of infiltration area on that site and a matter of fact their parking threshold is much less than what would be there for an in, for the same size building at a commercial rate so they're actually going to have more open space than they would normally have on this particular area so they're not even maxing out what their allowance is for ISR. So I have limited concerns with the drainage and that those were the big concerns were traffic and drainage and lighting and noise. And um, the lighting is going to be required to be shielded and directed inward just like we do on every other project. And again, the noise, I think, is you're going to have a limited issue with noise because this is a self-contained facility. So you're going to have wreckers and they can speak to what their hours of operation really are. So when the time comes to uh, develop the uh, the area where the subpoena center was going to go, the drainage has to be readdressed. That's correct. Every time that this the every time a project comes in on the site, they have to they have to address that drainage. So they have to go back to the original master drain drainage plan and uh, attenuate their what their what their percentage is going to be. And there's actually an agreement between the parties that actually own all the property. So as a result, there is a very complicated agreement to make sure that that and it's met it's met its swift mud the swift mud requirements Back to you. Um, unless the applicant has any cross-examination of the city then it's time for the applicants presentation Thank you and good evening. I'm Ed Armstrong. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Hillward Henderson, located at 600 Cleveland Street, Suite 800 in Clearwater. My client here is Caliper Collision. They are the contract buyer of the subject property. Um, I don't, certainly don't want to reiterate the very thorough report you've had from your planning staff today. Um, this is a land use map amendment and a rezoning. 
Um, I think the big takeaway is that we believe and agree with your staff that this application is consistent with your goals, objectives, and policies of your comprehensive plan. One thing I will highlight with respect to the IPD zoning request is that in the context of zoning, this gives you maximum control in that it's site plan specific zoning. We will come back later as we all was previously discussed, but you normally uh, as a commission don't have that level of control in a Euclidean zoning application, but you do in a plan development, which is what is before you tonight. Um, there was a question uh, that was discussed earlier this evening about spot zoning. Um, I am under oath. I do concur with the opinion voiced by your city attorney that this does not constitute spot zoning if approved uh, under applicable Florida law. Uh, I have a couple of witnesses for you tonight. I'm going to lead off with um, Mr. Rusty Cohen. He is here tonight. He is with the developer. He is also a professional engineer by training, education, background, and experience. And he's going to walk you through uh, what caliber collision is. He's also going to address some of the issues uh, that were raised uh, with respect to drainage of the site, um, things of that nature. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Cohen to come forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rusty Cohen with uh, Cross Development. Uh, our address is 4336 uh, Marsh Ridge Road in uh, Carrollton, Texas, 75010. Uh, we are a national developer. We do build a suit uh, developments uh, for our clients, in this case, uh, Caliber Collision. Uh, we're currently under contract to purchase uh, the property. Um, and with that, we will we do the entitlements and uh, and construct the building, and then we lease it to Caliber Collision. Um, I've got a little presentation, um, kind of give you a little history of uh, Caliber Collision. Um, probably around the first of the year, uh, Caliber uh, combined they merged with a group called uh, Abra Auto Glass. Uh, which took them to over well over a thousand stores uh, we're in 37 states now uh, previous to that caliber was probably 650 to 700 locations uh, before the merger uh, we've got an annual revenue of about 3.8 billion um, over 18,000 uh, employees uh, and commissioner uh, to answer your question we will this location will have probably 20 to 25 um, jobs um, annual sales for this this site would probably be in the neighborhood of uh, three million to three and a half million dollars um caliber's motto uh, as you see here is uh restoring the rhythm of your life uh they, they kind of get it they know they're getting you on a on a bad uh bad day where your where your vehicle's uh, been damaged and their whole their whole point is to get it done as as quick and economical as they can and back to you again to restore the rhythm of your life uh you know when you're when you're down a car <coughs> you know you're getting rides shuffling people around uh they, they completely understand it's a you know trying situation for a couple weeks um again you can see some of their uh their core values uh, and uh, again the, the big one uh, they train their employees and uh, down the end uh, focusing on the customer Again, you know, their, their whole business, like I said, is customer service, getting your vehicle back to you correct, you know, on time, on an economic development. Um, as you can see, this, this slide here talks, um, they do a lot of work uh, with insurance companies, with car lots. Um, some of their uh, awards with USAA and some other uh, insurance industry, uh, farmer's insurance, uh, as well um, and this this slide really just kind of talks about their <coughs> customer service score you can see some of the uh, national folks there and and how they they rank with those guys um, as far as training um, caliber uh, with a lot of the uh, work that goes on it's, it's pretty specialized um, work they spend about 15 million a, a year in training their associates 
Um, also on a commitment to communities, uh, they are very, very much active in their community. Um, they do a lot of work with, uh, with veterans. Uh, they have a recycled ride program where they work with veteran families. Um, also a program they've just started that, I apologize for not making the slide, uh, but they work with uh, the Department of Defense uh, for veterans who've been out uh, six months or so. Uh, they hire them, train them, provide the tools. After three years, uh, they get to keep those tools, um, whether they're hired there or move on down the road. Um, again, just some of their other uh, commitments uh, to the community and uh, veterans. Uh, as far as site plan, um, you can see we've got a little over 16,000 square foot building. Uh, the uh, front part of that building will all be offices. Uh, the back part of that will be overhead doors where the cars are driving in uh, to be worked on. Everything will be inside with the exception there's a, a detail bay and a small storage area outside. Uh, that detail bay will be covered. We, uh, we wash cars before we bring them back around uh, to, the, to the customer. Uh, that detail bay will also have its own drain and sand oil separator. Uh, there's a site plan with the landscaping depicted on it. Uh, this particular slide is kind of showing the pond in the neighborhood. Um, this dimension from the corner of that building uh, to that nearest house is 268 feet, I do believe. Um, let's go back. The, let me see here. Uh, the existing fence uh, that you spoke of, Vice Mayor, there's an eight foot fence right here on the uh, eastern property line uh, that will remain in place. And then we have landscape buffer as well until you get to the, the fence part of our building. Um, our entire site here in the back will be where our employees park and where we store, again, cars that are awaiting repair as we get parts. Uh, that will all be screened uh, with, a, with fence. Uh, there'll be two gates here as well. Uh, this is a elevation of uh, the building that we're proposing. Um, the structure itself is kind of a, a, a pre-engineered metal building uh, with spans. Um, you can see the, the stone and the, the port on the front side. Um, again, the fence will screen out most of these uh, overhead doors uh, with a six-foot fence, a uh, wood privacy fence around there. Uh, this is uh, just floor plan um, showing the bays. Again, we've got the offices up front, lobby and offices. Uh, this area here is where the, uh, the paint booth will be, and, uh, and talk about that a little bit more. Um, here's the, the detail bay. Um, as you can see, that detail bay area right here and, and here will be covered it won't necessarily be enclosed it'll be open on the on the three sides but it, it will be covered on the top um again we'll have 20 25 uh new jobs uh 40 percent of those will be local within five miles of the site um, i also show this this slide as well as far as some of the pay ranges um from tech technician standpoint uh paint booth operator those type of jobs are are well compensated jobs. This isn't, you know, it's not going to be a house with 20 minimum wage jobs, minimum wage jobs. Um, again, some of the advances in the in the paint booth area. Um, you mentioned the EPA. Uh, we do have to remove 98 percent of the particulates um, in that. That that paint booth will be a. Uh, we have a separate vendor uh, that comes in and will build that inside the building. Our our main structure will be sprinkled. That will have its own separate ventilation and sprinkler system as well. Um, all of our paint is water-based paint now. Um, and again, we talk, a lot of the training uh, that goes in is from this paint booth. It, uh, again, computerized, mixes, uh, mixes the paint, 
so there's no overspray. Again, ventilation. Uh, those those filters are changed on a you know per use basis. So it's all computerized. If they get if they get clogged, we have a third party vendor that comes in and and will change those out. Uh, and I think last time at the, one of the meetings, uh, public ask if we stored those on site. We do not. They come in and change them and leave. Uh, that's this just cut sheet of again third party vendor item that that gets built separately as we complete that building. Uh, in closing, again, uh, Caliber Collisions, largest uh, auto body repair shops in the in the country. Um, we're not we're not ch changing tires. We're not working on engines. Uh, we're not doing oil changes. We're strictly auto body repair collision center. Um, and with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, I had four questions that most of them have been answered. One was on a traffic study. Uh, you say that uh, this business actually generates less traffic than any other business. Uh, Correct. It, it will generate less than what was approved for this lot, the retail piece. and. I'm not a traffic guy. We do have our traffic engineer here uh, that can definitely speak to that. Yeah. My other question was a drainage, which he was uh, touched by uh, our planning and zoning director. Uh, correct. The The actual drainage uh, comes to this pond here. And I, I believe, uh, if I pulled the history correctly, I think that was approved in 2003. Um, let me see here. I don't think any buildings were constructed at the time. They put in the drainage, and I, I believe they in, installed some of the traffic improvements. Uh, for whatever reason, that project uh, wasn't built. I believe in 2008, Northern Tool came in and modified the existing permit that was for that pond uh, through the Water Management District, which we'll have to do the same as well, because that, that pond has been designed for a certain amount of impervious and a certain amount um, of flow going to it. Again, we'll, we'll modify that permit to, to prove that we meet those requirements. And there are still vacant properties here that could put buildings. Um, they would do the same thing when they come in. Yeah. The other question I have was the, uh, the noise. Is this business would generate noise enough to disturb the, uh, the, the houses, the, the, the residents in the back? It, again, everybody's going to have a different level of noise. The, the building itself is a insulated metal panel, uh, which will provide some noise reduction. And, and I can get you that study that we have as well. Um, I will say when I left here uh, in May at the planning commission meeting, um, the next day I stopped at a store in uh, Lutz and I was on the shop floor. Um, speaking to the manager and they had tools going and we were talking normal not having to yell I would say when I went outside very similar to here I, the, the road noise was as much or more than than what was inside that building the nearest house 268 feet so that's the not disturbing but is that what you're saying uh, I'm saying we have again we'll have an insulated metal panel building that's two inches thick with foam um, part of our lease. Uh, this particular area, I do believe we're installing an air conditioner in the shop. Um, again, I'm not an operator, but I would assume if they have an air conditioner there, they're going to have those uh, doors down, um, except for bring cars in and out, but while they're working during the day, um, which would reduce the noise as well. My last question is on air pollution. Using chemicals, uh, what provisions do you make are you going to make to uh, prevent any uh, chemicals escape into the atmosphere? Oh, well, again, uh, that paint booth is in the filter system, filtration system, <coughs> and ventilation system. Um, it's designed uh, for the EPA requirements, again, to remove the 98% particulates. What's the percentage again? Uh, 98%. 98%. Yeah, and, uh, I may have the actual. I do not. There again, the, I, I don't recall that actual portion of the code. Uh, but again, this is designed by a third-party vendor, um, and 
will meet those codes. Thank you for answering my question. Any questions, Vice Chair? Thank you. Can you go to the uh, slide with the aerial that you showed, uh, with the basically the footprint of the building? Okay, thank you. There. So you're saying that uh, that retention pond to the east uh, was part of the master plan back in the day when this site was laid out? Uh, no, I, I believe that's part of the neighborhood. The, the pond that we are draining to is here. I think there's a wetlands portion as well. That that all of this development comes to this pond here. Can't see the uh, red pointer, but it's not your fault. Uh, um, it's just south. Uh, I'd say just south of our building is okay, where that existing now. pond yeah, is. It's a pond there. Okay. All right. Um, so then the portion of the land to the, I guess it would be to the south. That is part of the subject property that you're buying, the undeveloped land to the south of the footprint of the building? No, sir. We are just buying this property here okay. uh, where our building and parking are on. Um, again, we have allowed or some cross connection here for future development. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this northern tool, anything that would develop here is going to drain down here to that pond, gotcha. just as we will. So the, the corner there at the entrance of Riverwatch is a, is a separate out parcel that would be available? I, I don't recall because I don't, I don't recall what they had, had originally planned. It's not part of our property, but I, I do believe they had some outlaws planned there as well as another building through here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they're all answered. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious uh, about the local job statistic. I think it was 40% are going to be within five miles of the site, right? Correct. Okay. Um, that sounds awesome. So I'd like to get an update on that, you know, once the site's, um, you know, potentially up and running. Because I know it's just, it's right on the border of Tarpon Springs. Okay. So I, my, my only concern, and again, I'm not trying to tell you who to hire, but it could be five miles up north right. and not, you okay. know, hire anybody in Tarpon Springs. So i just like to get an update on that, um, you know, potentially if, if this gets rolling um, and, and get some more detail. Okay. That's it. Okay. Hey, Mr. Mayor, unless the city staff has any cross-examination of the applicant, or is the applicant done, do you have any other? Uh, no, sir, I'm not done presenting witnesses yet. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, did we respond to all your questions that you had? You had your four questions. Are you comfortable with the answers? Yeah. Okay. Um, the one thing, I don't want to be overly repetitive here, but on the drainage, I think the simplest way to view it is that this was um, initially approved as one large master plan development. It was like between eight and nine acres. This is a 2.3 acre sub parcel but it was all designed to drain into that southeast corner, the entirety of the parcel. It was properly approved, it was permitted, and it is functioning today in compliance with those approvals. <clears throat> there will be a modification, but um, everything there was designed from day one to have the entirety of that planned development drain into that southeastern portion of the property. Uh, thank you for your patience with that. The next witness I have is Mr. Michael Yates, and he is a professional transportation planner. There was a lot of discussion uh, at PNZ and in the staff report regarding traffic impacts in this proposed project. So we thought the best thing we could do was to bring forward our transportation expert to walk you through what his analysis was and certainly respond to any questions from the commission. Good evening, Michael Yates, uh, White House Group, uh, 400 North Tampa Street, uh, Tampa. Um, I wanted to walk through the transportation for you real quick because I know there was a couple of questions from the board and also during the planning board as well uh, related specifically to trip generation uh, for both the overall project and for this project and also access for the site and what the road configuration looked like because we got a lot of questions during that about the existing road configuration. So this project will generate 38 a.m. peak hour trip ends and 53 p.m. peak hour trip ends. As contrast, the overall project was approved for 91,000, 
91,282 square feet with 197 a.m. peak hour trip ends and 508 p.m. peak hour trip ends. So after this project and Northern Tool, there's still 49,252 square feet remaining uh, from the old approvals with 104 a.m. peak hour trip ends and 315 p.m. peak hour trip ends. Um, is there a pointer on here? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so access for the site will be here. This is a, a left in, right in, right out driveway. So there is an existing southbound left turn lane here. Uh, it is about 340 feet long. Uh, we estimate the queue to be about 75 feet. Uh, so there is plenty of queue storage for this southbound left turn lane to allow the project to enter. There is also a northbound right turn lane uh, that begins just past River Watch. And this was some of the conversations that came up during the planning board. The northbound right turn lane for River Watch ends at River Watch, and you cannot go through it. It's not the continuous right turn lane that you see along US 19 in a lot of places. It ends at River Watch. So once you come out of River Watch, there's a little acceleration lane, and then it goes into an exclusive northbound right turn lane uh, that goes to this project and continues on up uh, to Phoenix. The, that will accommodate the project traffic. Uh, River Watch has its own exclusive southbound left turn lane. So these two traffic volumes should not interact at all for entering traffic. So this has its own exclusive southbound left and its own exclusive northbound right. Um, anyone exiting the site that wants to head south, they will come up here uh, to Lewis and make a U-turn. That northbound left turn lane is 600 feet long. Uh, that can more than accommodate the queue and volumes that we were seeing there with this project traffic. And even with the future, we only estimated about 250 feet of queue. It's over 600 feet long. Um, that's all I had, but I just wanted to make sure that we went through those. Those were the kind of questions that we were getting at the Planning and Zoning Board. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. Applicant finished? Okay, so uh, does the city staff have any cross-examination of the applicant? No, we do not. The only comment that I have is um, just to uh, Vice Mayor Tara Penny's, that balance of the site, it's not an out parcel, it's just undeveloped property. So at some point in time, they can come back in and ask for a master plan um, for that particular piece of property as well. So now, Mayor, we're at the part of the process where members of the public opposing the application may address the commission. I'm Joan Moffat. I live in Riverwatch, and I'm nervous, so forgive me. I'm going to tell you why our residents are united in opposition to the land to the north of our entrance being rezoned as industrial. And when I'm done, I'll pass out excerpts of the articles and studies that I reference. We have 160 homes in River Watch, ranging in price from a small home at a quarter of a million dollars to $600,000. According to Zillow, those aren't my values. I think it's a lovely development. I explained the potential rezoning to some of the residents. I spoke with those closest to the lot that is in question and those furthest from it. They were unanimous in opposing the rezoning. Not one of our residents, taxpayers, and voters thought that it, rezoning to industrial was a good idea. Why? They voiced concern about declining property values. John Lang, real estate attorney, writes, generally land that is zoned industrial may be worth significantly less than land zoned for residential use. 
which in turn may be valued less than property for commercial use. So industrial is the lowest value for land use. How does industrial zoning rezoning affect our property values? <coughs> A study published in the Southeastern Economic Review on how development affects residential value states. Not all studies find significant negative effects on non-residential land uses upon home values, though proximity to industrial land uses is almost universally found to have a deleterious effect. That's the heart of part of our opposition to this rezoning. Proximity to industrial land uses is almost universally found to have a deleterious effect on home values. <coughs> is there data to back that up? A 2015 study titled The Impact of Commercial Development on Surrounding Residential Property Values by Dr. John Wiley, Associate Professor in the Department of Real Estate at Georgia State University's Robinson Business School stated, industrial is one of the least desirable land uses. The Atlanta area study based on data from nine years found that properties located close to new industrial development are significantly lower priced than those close to new retail development. How much lower? The average price in the study had $143,000 for homes next to industrial versus $164,000 for next to retail and $223,000 for homes close to new office development. Keep in mind that study was for nine years, so that had the values during the Great Recession which weren't very attractive. How does that affect us? I tried to be conservative and use an average house price in River Watch of $350,000. Less than 10% of our properties are valued at under $300,000 and only two are valued at under $275,000. If you look down River Edge, which is the homes on the water, most of those homes or almost all those homes are $400,000 to $600,000. With 160 properties, that overall property value for Riverwatch is $56 million. By changing the zoning from commercial to industrial, we're talking about potentially stripping away over $10 million in land value, in, in property values. So you can understand why our residents are upset. If we were fortunate enough to get an office building there instead, it might add millions, up to $19 million, according to the figures from the study, to the aggregate river watch value. I've lived here nine years. I love Tarpon. I think you guys have done a great job of beautifying Tarpon Springs, especially with the Palm Islands on US 19. So we're confused as to why you want to put an industrial business as one of the first things visitors to Tarpon or potential residents of Tarpon see when coming southbound on US 19. Please protect our property value and do not approve the rezoning from commercial to industrial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wait, wait. Let's wait till all the comments are finished, Cliff. No, no, not you. I was talking about the attorney. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Mr. Armstrong, let's finish with all the comments. First. Um, I think Mr. Armstrong wanted to cross-examine, is that correct? Yes, it is. And he's entitled to cross-examine, so. Yes, ma'am, I do. Go right ahead. Oh, okay, let me just Yeah, go ahead. You want me to just, I can just pass him down. So ma'am, go back up. Why don't you go back up to the microphone so that yeah, you can Robert, be heard. How do you want us to handle the logistics of this? The two of you can stand next to each other and you can just ask your questions. Okay. Um, under the rules of engagement for quasi-judicial hearings, I have the opportunity to cross-examine you, like the residents you may have in the PNZ question my experts. But understand it's not meant to be difficult or to try to harass you or embarrass you. That's not my objective. I, I'm sure it's not. Thank you. Um, and to be fair, there's only one reason why I'm cross-examining you, and that's because you entered evidence into the record here that seemed to resonate of the testimony of someone with some expert knowledge. I have no expert knowledge. I plan F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Force engines 
I plan jet engines. Okay, but we're That's talking about <laughs> property values and um, you know values and I appraisal. pulled the values off the internet. I said in okay. the in I pulled it off of Zillow. Those values are from Zillow. They're not mine. Okay, let me get into my questions. Though. <laughs> okay. Do you have any education with respect to property values? No. Have you ever been on a professional appraiser? No. Um, have you ever testified as an expert? No. Uh, in this field? No. Okay. So. I'm just would voicing you, the concerns of people that. Fair talk enough. To me. So then, is it fair to characterize your testimony as that of a lay witness as opposed to an expert witness? Absolutely. Thank you. That's all I need. Is, is there anyone, any other citizen speaking in opposition? Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Franco, and I've lived at uh, 1949 Anclote Vista and River Watch for four years and eight years in other areas of Tarpon. It took us five years of searching, but we finally found our perfect retirement home, a quiet, secluded neighborhood of beautiful, well-kept homes and wonderful neighbors. Although it's only a stone's throw from US 19, and I live right uh, on the other side of the pond, right by the bike path between the two ponds that you see there, so I will be definitely affected by this. Um, I, I hear no noise from 19 now, except the occasional siren and, a, and, a, and the, the rice rockets that occasionally zoom by. Now, being a business owner myself for over 35 years, I truly understand the rights of people and companies to run a business and make a living. Caliber's publicity states that it seeks to be the top dog in auto damage repair business, and it's a worthy goal. We don't just seek to deny Caliber the opportunity to operate its business in Tarpon Springs. We only challenge the concept that the proposed site is the best fit for Caliber, for Riverwatch, and for Tarpon Springs itself. First, in researching other auto damage repair businesses in the area, I found that there are at least a dozen auto collision repair centers within a six mile radius of the proposed site. Approximately half of these shops are located on US 19. Others are situated on side streets a short distance from 19. Uh, the approval of the zone change to allow Caliber to run its operation at this location would put an undue burden on the existing shops, many of whom have been tax paying businesses for years. New businesses coming into the, t the city should, not, should be an asset, not a hardship on our local businesses that have been there for many years. And is there enough work to spread around with the addition of a high profile nationwide chain? Caliber has been denied permits in other locations such as Virginia and Pennsylvania for just such reason. Caliber is also proud of its quality of work and the fact that the people who will seek them out for their high quality services. If that is the case, I question the absolute necessity of a location on US 19, which is a high traffic, high profile, high visibility area. The services provided by Caliber are not those which lend itself to someone who is driving down 19 and would tend to be an impulse buyer or an impulse customer. If indeed the work there f that speaks for itself, it would not matter to prospective customers that they would, not, would have to drive off the main street to get a quality product. Caliber also states that it strives to be a good neighborhood, neighbor in the communities in which it operates. And we laud that effort. Should the commission, we are not saying that we're not opposed to this, we do oppose it. But should the commission decide to approve the petitions before them, we at Riverwatch would also like to be good neighbors. In that vein, we would reach out to Caliber to see if they would be amenable to going the extra mile in an attempt to ease the anxieties of our residents by increasing buffers between the association property and their location, or another gesture s similar of neighborliness. To borrow a phrase from Robert Frost, good fences make good neighbors. I would like to point out that it is not only those of us who are able to be present tonight that have great concerns. I have here oppositions signed by 74 homeowners out of the 159 who also oppose the, the change and the business that it wants to go in. In closing, Many people consider Tarpon Springs to be the jewel of North Pinellas. I definitely agree. People traveling on 19 expect a certain number of commercial retail and office businesses on such a roadway. However, putting an industrial enterprise at the gateway of our town may not be the best way to showcase all the amenities Tarpon has to offer. Can Caliber's goal be accomplished without a zone change? 
Is there a location in an already zoned industrial general area that would suit its needs? Is there an alternative such as a variance or an exemption which would prevent the entire undeveloped section of land from being rezoned? <coughs> Excuse me. We are not opposed to pre-enterprise. However, we are solely seeking to protect the quality of our investment in our homes. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Any other residents that are uh, in opposition? Good evening. My name is Peter Connor. I'm a resident of Riverwatch. I live about three feet past the flag, so I probably won't be affected by any noise. However, just to uh, qualify myself, I've ran uh, a $2 billion industrial complex out in Arizona. And I've also done it here in Florida. And uh, at both locations, I had body shops included in those. Uh, and yes, there's a lot of noise. Uh, doors get opened to move a vehicle out, to move a vehicle in. Others are shut, but you're going to continue hearing that noise. There are air tools being used, and they do affect us. Um, the road noise back where I live, there's nothing. Road noise, when you come up to the entrance of our building, is loud from years 19 already. So that'll just add to it, to those homeowners that are adjacent. Uh, another concern I have is the wall that's being talked about, the buffer. That wall was originally put in by our development. And when Northern Tools was approved, that wall was, part of the deal was that wall had to get raised to go to eight feet. Previously, it was about five and a half to six foot. Uh, when that wall got raised, nobody ever took into consideration the, the uh, footer of the wall. And during one of the rain events, the wall collapsed, the part of the wall collapsed. Riverwatch paid for that repair. We don't know if during another rain event, as this property gets disturbed again, we will have further damage to that wall. Uh, the city of Tartman Springs did not uh, stand up and help us out last time it collapsed, so I'm kind of concerned with that. That was approximately $135,000 worth of damage. Um, the other issue I do have is the retention. Uh, we've talked about it. It was a master plan. Uh, development, uh, but with a change to light industrial, what are the changes going to be to those pond, to that particular pond? And that pond then in turn drains into the wetlands, and the wetlands go right into our beautiful river, the Anclote. And I am concerned about that as well. So perhaps you guys could address that, and uh, I thank you for your time. Um, my name is Jennifer Callahan. I'm at 1001 Sawgrass Drive. My house is at the northern corner of that big pond there. Um, our major concerns as a family is obviously any toxic effects to our young children here um, and any of the families that live um, in the adjoining homes. Um, there's a, another family that's out of town right here that I'm also representing. Um, that's the Winter family. They live at the um, east corner on Anclote Vista. Um, they also had, the, they have three young children. They're um, also very concerned about any toxic effects from the in, uh, being changed to industrial, not necessarily from caliber, but if we change ca the area specifically for caliber, we still have area to the north and area to the south. And so are the new businesses that come into those areas, are they gonna be industrial and what kind of toxic effects are they gonna bring to the area? Um, so if we change it to industrial for them, like what are we gonna change to industrial in the future? Um, so that's something that um, I highly want to consider um, with this proposal. Um, second, um, with the U-turn at Lois Avenue, um, anybody that leaves Riverwatch Boulevard, that's the first access for us to be able to travel southbound on 19, is to do that U-turn at Lois. That's the only way that we can travel southbound unless we continue up to the light at Home Depot. Um, so that U-turn um, access at Lois Avenue does get backed up um, significantly during high time traffic times. Um, also, during rush hour home between um, 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock, it's almost a gridlock to get out of Riverwatch as it is. Um, so increasing um, 
volume even just a little bit is, is gonna be a significant impact to us leaving the neighborhood um, during um, rush hour times. Um, and then also the effect of that the other lady was so point to point out is the um, effect of homeowner values. You know, I think that we have a very high caliber neighborhood. Um, our HOA does a wonderful job taking care of our neighborhood and what kind of community actually praises their HOA, but we do. We love our HOA and we support our HOA. Um, so anything that they have brought to the table, you know, we fully support that. So, cause we are a very tight knit community, I think in Riverwatch. Um, lastly, for very selfish reasons, uh, I am um, concerned about the noise because I am a night shift nurse. I do sleep during the day. My house is very close to this proposed property. Um, I don't have any effects from Northern Tool being retail. I am concerned about the effects of the industrial being able to sleep for the very short allotted time that I have while my children are at school. Um, I have you know, time to sleep between eight and two while my kids are at school, enough to save lives during the night. So um, just selfish reasons for the noise so that I can continue to be a great nurse. So thank you. Evelyn Connor, 1237 Black Rush Drive. I'm the HOA president. Uh, we've lived in Riverwatch now for almost 14 years. Whenever we went, uh, before we moved to Tarpon Springs, uh, before we retired, we made a trip back here to Florida and driving around, we decided that Tarpon Springs was where we wanted to live. I just did not want to have to deal with US-19. Unfortunately, we found Riverwatch, which we fell in love with Riverwatch. The first house that we looked at was on Sawgrass, and it backed up to what is now Northern Tool. And the real estate agent that showed us the house guaranteed us that, that, house, uh, that the property could never be developed because Tarpon Springs had regulations that would take care of it. So that it would never be changed so that what was there when we first moved into Riverwatch, it was all just wild acreage, but it was for sale. And I knew that everything is gonna get developed sooner or later and you want a good neighbor, but I knew that what was in the backyard of sawgrass at that time, it was going to get developed. So we went ahead and we looked at other places. Our realtor ended up taking us back into Riverwatch and the house that we ended up buying, no one can ever develop our backyard. It's Ancloat River. It's safe. The rest of Riverwatch won't be. Whenever we leave our dedicated <clears throat> exit, it's our one exit. It's also our one entrance. We used to have people who lived in Riverwatch that whenever they would exit, they would go ahead and exit south, our one entrance coming in from the northbound. So if anybody was traveling south on 19 trying to come into Riverwatch and they were trying to leave, they would have to wait for the traffic so that they could go, so that they wouldn't have to go up north to Lois to have to turn around. But doing the research I did, Caliber does look like a good neighbor. But what's going to happen north of Caliber? What's going to happen south of Caliber? <sighs> and fences make good neighbors, but our fence fell down once before. We love Tarpon Springs and we don't want to move, but it's hard enough to get out as it is. Now it's up to you guys. Any other citizens that are in opposition that wish to speak? Okay, so now we're moving into the uh, members of the public in support of the application. Are there any members of the public in support of the application? Okay, uh, seeing no one approaching the podium, then it will be 
the applicant's closing statement and summary. Thank you. Folks, this is US Highway 19, your most intensive corridor in your city. You've heard a lot of testimony tonight. You're required to weigh the land use map amendment as against your goals, objectives, and policies of your comprehensive plan and the rezoning application based upon the competent substantial evidence that was induced at tonight's hearing. We believe we have fully and completely answered the questions, every last question posed by the neighbors and this commission. Drainage is not a reason to deny this application. Traffic is not a reason to deny this application. There's gonna be no material impact to the neighboring properties. There's distance, there's a wall, there's a pond. There's a lot of development pressure on any vacant parcels, particularly in Tarpon Springs. This property is currently vacant. It has, as we sit here tonight, commercial entitlements. What's being proposed is a weekday use, and it closes at, at the end of a normal business day. As a matter of right, this property owner could put in an intense commercial use that could be opened on weekends, nights, that could generate significant impacts. I'm thinking of a Chuck E. Cheese, allowed as a matter of law. What's a, better, what's a better outcome? We think that when you weigh everything out, that the impacts from this proposed project is materially less than many, many other uses currently allowed as a matter of right. To that end, uh, we believe we've met our burden tonight. We have carried the day. We have put forth the evidence you need to make your decision in favor of this applicant. Thank you for your time and attention. Staff's closing statement. I'm just available for any questions if you have any. Thank you. We are now going to commission comments. Commissioner Sieber. Yes, uh, I had a question about the, the wall that they were discussing. How far is the wall from uh, the proposed property? <clears throat> How much is the landscape buffer? It's on the property line. It's on the property I think line? So, yeah. The wall is on the property line, but I don't know what the distance from the buffer is then there in the back. <clears throat> Five point seven. Eight. Eighty-five point seven. Oh, eighty-five. Done. Okay. So there's a fifteen-foot buffer. Then they've got a fence, and then they've got their parking area, and then the wall is on the other side of their fifteen-foot buffer. Okay. So. Um. And and a business can be can go in between the those properties, right? On the on the south side. And on the north so, side. So. <coughs> there's enough room for other development on the north and south side of this proposed development. All right, so it's a development. All right. So this up here is not changing. This remains commercial. Right. This down here is not changing. This remains commercial with the exception of the retention pond here. You can't do much with the retention pond unless you So potentially yeah. there's so development. There's potentially commercial here. There's potentially commercial that could actually go where where um, potentially over here. This was actually, there's a zero lot line here and there's actually potentially commercial development that can go here and into this site. They are just in this two acre right. site just right. right here. So potentially there's a lot more development that can happen. Theoretically, yes. I mean, they would have to come in for a final development plan if they, if they stay within the zoning that, that you've already approved on that site. Okay. Thank you. Heather, if we have another request to change the zoning to the industrial, what other uses you can have for that? 
Well, they're limited because this is a PD. They're limited to whatever use comes in. You'd have to have the same type of hearing. It's not like a Leconian zoning where it's every use that's allowed in, in commercial. Every time, if this building was to vacate, let's just say that you, pro you proposed and approved this and Caliber Collision left. The next person coming in, if they did anything other than a body shop, would have to come back to this board because it's a different use. So this is very use specific. It's actually not only use specific, but it is site plan specific. So there are only certain modifications that they can make to the site plan once you've approved the final development order without coming back before this board. But the use will be grandfathered in at the time that the that the rezoning change actually occurs so at this time if they were let's say bring their, their development plan and they changed a use or sold it to someone else they're starting the process all over again it's a very use specific a very controlled process when you're dealing with plan developments does that answer the question okay any other question vice mayor thank you um uh, Heather, in regard to this application, can you give some idea in terms of uh, additional meetings that are necessary for this application to move forward? If, assuming we approve tonight, it goes. So the next step is it's going to go to the county for um, a countywide plan amendment. Um, there's a three-step process there. It goes to uh, very similar to our technical review team. It's a, made up of all the county planners. We sit we sit as a group. Um, then it will go to the Ford Pinellas board. They'll act on it, and then finally it'll go to it'll go to it'll go to the county commission. It'll then come back to you. Um, and any modifications that they've requested will then address if they request any modifications. Um, we're pretty confident that there won't be the modifications because we did do a pre-app with them purposely to avoid that. And then there's also, then there's still site plan approval as well? And then, yeah, once, the, once that's all done, that'll settle the zoning issue and they'll have to come back with a final development plan, plan before they can even start the building permit process. In so they've got case, some time. In which case, things like lighting, buffer, Etc. can be addressed, modified, improved upon. Agreed, okay. yes. Um, and then, so we're on US-19. Generally in, in town we see a zoning of like highway business on US-19, right? Mm -hmm. And some of those permitted uses within highway business are like adult stores. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to make that point that, you know, the devil you know in some cases is better than the one you don't. So, I mean, given that all these activities are going to be held indoors, and it is pretty restricted in terms of an industrial use. In my opinion, this use is better than an adult store. That's my opinion. So, I mean. Agreed. I take this. I think I'm going to share that opinion. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments? I just want to say I agree with uh, Vice Mayor. Um, and there's potential development that can happen on either side which you know would create traffic um, I think this according to the traffic study would create less traffic than uh, a retail uh, area or a restaurant or whatever type of use but um, I just feel like this is a safer choice for this development I know you're on 19 I appreciate all the compassion but I looked at River Watch and the reason I didn't buy there was because it was on 19. I'm sorry because it, it's such a busy road um, and it's beautiful once you get in there um, but yeah development happens and I appreciate all your comments. Thank you. Any other comments? I've got a question for staff. Uh, Heather, is, uh, is there anything holding back the HOA from planting bamboo or oak trees or cypress trees or cedar trees along the west side of the retention pond between the retention pond and the fence or wall at all? Only the, only the you know, with the limitations of the distance between the actual edge of the pond, they just have to be concerned with their swift mud approval. So they can't do anything that would undermine the pond. But as long as there's a, a distance there that they can actually do plantings, they can plant whatever they would like there. Yeah, uh, it may be advantageous for the HOA to look at some opportunities to do some additional plantings in those areas. Uh, one thing, it mitigates the sound from Highway 19, also mitigates... Um, just aesthetics as well uh, for any future planning that may go on these other properties as well. So I just want to point that out. Any other comments? I will entertain a motion for item number 11A, which is the ordinance 2019-10. This is for the future land use. 
Motion to approve. Uh, I'll second, Mayor. We're just taking them one at a time? Yes. Okay. This is item, uh, this is the one is 2019-10. I second. You second? Mm -hmm. Okay. Roll call, please. Mr. Donovan? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Terrapenny? Yes. Mayor Alhousis? Yes. Thank you. We are now going to vote on uh, item number 11B, which is the ordinance 2019-11. This is for the uh, amending of the zoning map. I need a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Terrapani? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? Yes. Thank you. And this is the first reading. We have to come back again for the second reading. If you have any more information, please come back. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. We are now going to take five minutes uh, recess, and we'll be right back. No, as I announced when I was reading the uh, titles to the ordinances, it's got to go to the county first. And so once the county, we have no idea, but yeah, yeah, the, the keep looking at the city's website and it'll get posted again. So I would recommend that you guys contact um, the architect and see what their plans is or talk to Doug. Well, yeah, especially if an attorney is there. Um, even though he's not represented as an attorney. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't need to be resolved, but what needs to be resolved is we need a plan that we can approve. Sure. And everybody's got to look at it. Nobody's had time to look at it. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ask how your trip went. Okay. Yeah, they're going to be there. So I appreciate you. Yeah, I should. Yeah, if the hospital is coming. Okay. One of our. One of our. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that would, I told you you picked a weird, you picked one that would be a good one. I did, I did. I'm very thankful to All right, you. And I will be speaking with yes, you. Yes, keep in touch with me for next semester or whenever it ends up because okay. when, we do the, when we do the land development code updates, I'll shoot them your way. Awesome. And once I know that you're. Well, yes, that's why I was thinking it was going to have to be phased. Yes, and I'll say uh, uh, I found it interesting. All right, darling. It was nice to meet you. Oh, my pleasure. Heather. Thank you so much. I didn't go yet. I go at the end of July. My race is at the end of July. I thought you were out of here like right after our thing. I went to, I, right after that, I went to a training session, which was actually really good up in, up in Baltimore. I'm going back to the same place doing the next class for a week. Okay. And then I'm going for two weeks to California. No, I, no, no. no. Uh, marathon, which is nice. No, we don't have any, on the rocks and stuff, we don't have any issue. We don't have any, I, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, trying to do, and. And again, we may have to phase it. If so, I'm like ready for that now. Yeah. After this, I'm ready for that. This was like, so, this is going to be not a, this one's going to be a more huge. That's why I understand the, the, the um, cost of designing is because they're going to have to figure out how to, I guess, remove and replace <laughs> the sidewalk and go I guess that's going to be a lot of the cost. How are you doing yeah. that? Are you doing it every night? Uh huh. <laughs> you need to rent an apartment. You seriously do. Well, I mean, you can't stay away from your family. I, mean, that's, I know. That's I have I have a couple of people that I know of doing the same thing. Like they work up here okay. in Pasco, and their families are in Manatee County because they, you know, lost their job and they're trying to figure, figure out finish out their last couple of five years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and say an FRS, so they won't we'll all get, go. We'll all get together in the next couple of weeks. We just, we just all, let's get together in the next couple of weeks before we go to them and bring that back. Yeah, so I imagine it's gonna probably come back in June. Talking about he's, okay. he's Misty, like meet in the middle because when I came back, I was on a um, on a planning yeah. thing with Misty because she's in the planning field. She works for planning engineers. No, I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, I know. I heard about that. Oh. But she um she worked with all. Of, I worked with them at the same time when they, before she led to King. I worked with got to work with both of them. She was actually in my section, so I knew her. And I told her, I said, I heard that Lockheed was doing. How is oh. that working? She goes, Oh, well, she's at home on the yeah. weekends. She yeah, five. <laughs> 
I, and I felt really sad. Oh, I know, because Walking <laughs> was there for a long time. He was good people. Well, Carol went. I wasn't surprised that that happened, though, because Carol went for it there anyways. after she was let go of Manatee County, too. So it, like, became the, like, the repository there, of all the people. I was like, it was, it was a bad. bad. See, the Manatee Commission ha has for many, many years been dividing four trees, pro-development versus mm -hmm. pro-environment, if you will. And it kept switching. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So when that all went down, it switched. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. four, three, three, four. Yeah, and they, they got really lost and out. Uh, but I, you know, I, I like Carol. Did, and uh, Carol and I never really got along, but Joaquin and I really got along because he's a zoner. So <laughs> like when I first started oh, in Manatee County, yeah. that was like. Yeah. Like yeah, we could have talked to him. So that. I would go over yeah. and talk to him like, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. like yeah. 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 Everybody was already on So he would sit with me for a long time, so I got to be around. I don't know what I was doing. when I left to go back to City County, I never thought a million years that they would end up here. And when Missy told me that I'm dreadful, it's not for me. That occurred. I might have to have a shower here in a minute. I tried to eat before our new 11 o'clock meeting. I know, I, I heard. Thought that, that, well, I heard that's who I was like, with one of the attorneys. He was living with one of the attorneys. I don't know if he's still living, but he was living with one of the attorneys when he first moved up there. So he would spend like the week there and then go home on the weekend. Oh, right. That is some kind of stuff. And it was tough for um, Misty because she told me she, goes, she had walked out of that mom there at their house. So it was, she's like, I got my mother in law living with her. And my husband's not even here. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, that is a tough listen, one. Listen, if you see him, tell him I said hi. I will. I don't see him very often, but every once in a while. I, do, I was going to say, I saw that. The building. <coughs> yeah. I told you jammies, didn't I? I, I did. I did. If you please take your seat so we can reconvene. Start again. Hammer, Mayor. I'm ready, ready. Mission of car. Oh. Oh. Read it, I'm ready. Let's Smack go. Commission Donovan, are you there? Ready to go. Didn't say we now reconvene the BOC meeting at uh, 9.23 p.m. The next item on the agenda is <laughs> resolution 2018-14, the application 1874 site plan Athens Place Apartments. City Attorney, 
is not here yet. <laughs> I have no problem reading the resolution if you'd like. City Attorney will read the resolution 2019-14, the application 18-74 for the site plan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Resolution 2019-14, a resolution of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application 1874, requesting site plan approval to develop a multifamily development, including construction of 36 apartment units in three buildings and construction of recreational amenities <clears throat> located on lots 37, 38, 48, B, and C of Mrs. S. Safford Parkins Subdivision and on lots 9 and 10 of Riverview Subdivision in the T4C Residential High Transect District of the Special Area Plan providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. Staff report. Good evening. Heather Earl, your planning and zoning director for and staff to this application. This application is a final site plan approval for a long time coming project. Um, this project consists of three apartment buildings um, consisting of 36 units total. And essentially what's occurred on this property is this developers kind of worked through the process with us. They actually had to go through the variance process first um, to submit for their parking locations on the sites that are located south of Athens Street um, to allow for the parking um, adjacent to the roadway. Normally the parking lots require to be set back from that first, what they call the first tier um, of the project. That we didn't, we agreed with the developer that I would rather have the residents that's adjacent to them not have a par have parking spaces right on top of them. So we wanted to give them a buffer area. So we agreed to uh, support the variance for them to have that variation um, on those lower parking on the lower parking lot. Then the other um, variation that they asked for is you actually have a requirement in your land development code that the retention ponds must have a five foot setback from the property line. In this case, they asked for a varying setback for their pond on the northern sites, and that was granted. So both those um, pieces of, of uh, information had to happen before we could move forward with the site plan approval. So what you have um, before you is a very complicated project on, an in, on a group of infill lots, which is the total intention of your special area plan. This is the epitome of what the special area plan was really developed to allow and to create. So this has been um, a joy of a project to work on. It's been about almost four years now um, in the making, so it's very awesome to see this come to uh, fruition. With that, um, this, the owner of this property is Damali Holdings. Um, uh, Nick Mavermatis is the uh, owner and um, developer of this property along with a, a group of uh, other folks. And he's here to speak tonight if you have specific questions about the project um, that he can, he can address those. Um, with that, essentially what we have is um, a project that is consistent with your comprehensive plan. It meets the criteria of your special air plan with the exception of the two variances that I mentioned that they have gone through the process to um, address those issues. So with that, they're meeting their zoning criteria as well. It's consistent with the land development code. It's consistent with the special area plan. They are consistent with their concurrency um, review. At this point in time, staff is recommending approval and I have a group of um, conditions that I want to um, read into the record. First, is the developer is responsible for meeting the minimum criteria of the land development code and acquiring all other jurisdictional permits and approvals. Construction plans shall be consistent with the approved site plan. All requisite fees <coughs> attendant to the project shall be paid in accordance with the land development code. 
the tree preservation plan street and street screening shall be compliant with the requirements of the land development code prior to the construction of the permit being issued prior to the issuance of the construction permit the project must address the city's sat to the city's satisfaction all of the city's comments regarding the applicant's proposed plan for the handling of the stormwater runoff as outlined in the comment memorandum dated April 29th, 2019 uh, from Brian Anderson, PE Icon uh, Consulting Group. The proposed site plan for handling stormwater runoff will require a modification for the Southwest Florida Water Management District permit for this project and a copy of the modification permit matching the approved stormwater runoff per plan per this condi per condition for above shall be provided to the city. The site plan shall expire at one year from the effective date unless the application has been filed for building permit with um, construction plans signed and sealed by a registered uh, engineer license in the state of Florida. And then this project went before um, the Planning and Zoning Board also on May 20th um, of this year. And it was you vote, you know, voted unanimously um, for approval with the conditions that I've stated in. So we're just looking to move this project forward and let them start construction um, of a project that is really meeting the criteria of what we were trying to intend for that special area location. I can answer any questions that you have. You mentioned about the uh, st uh, stormwater runoff. Would you go a little slow on that? Sure. Um, essentially, what's what's occurred is there's been some changing. There's been some changing conditions as we've kind of worked through the site planning issues, and they're going to have to submit for modification of their site their of their swift mud permit to allow this project to move forward because we have a variance and the variance window is starting to close. Um, they have limited time to move through the building permit process before they would have to come back to the variance process. Process. So we're trying to accommodate the, the developers. Um, the developers need to move forward into the process. These are conditions that we're confident that they can meet during the building permit process. Uh, modifications are very common during the building permit process for um, the uh, swift mud permit. So we're very confident that they can meet those conditions during building permits. So that's why we've conditioned it as such. Okay. I can answer any questions that you might have. Any other questions? Vice Mayor Terrafin. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Attorney, before I begin, I need to disclose ex parte communication uh, between myself and the developer. I have no financial gain or interest, but given the nature of the project and that it's been going on for the amount of time that it has been, uh, I have discussed this with the applicant. Um, that said, uh, I wanted to put that on the record, um, but I don't have really any questions for staff other than uh, as it relates to the stormwater and our consultant, uh, Brian Anderson. I just want to make sure that we're not... Uh, asking for more than what would be required on a swift mud level. Um, so given that swift mud would give it, would give them the permit for the stormwater retention and runoff, I just want to make sure that we're not overreaching on our part uh, and ask for more than what they would ask for. Um, I don't feel that we are. Um, basically, the one issue that we have that's kind of the point of contention is there's some off-site impacts that we just need to kind of work through that issue, and that's really what's left. And once that issues are, are addressed, it goes back to Swift Mud. They'll put their seal of approval on it, and hopefully everything flies through and we can we can start construction. Sounds good. Commissioner Clark, have a question? No? No, I was just, I mean... It's great to see some of these properties develop and the uh, uh, applicant come forward. Uh, I, I was reviewing the landscape plan, and it does look good also, or it's going to fit the neighborhood quite nicely, um, and they're not holding back on the type of plants and, um, and the amount of plants they're putting in, which is an encouraging thing to see. Yeah, okay. Applicant? Is the applicant going to present? Anything? There's no question. I just want to comment that, uh, uh, like what uh, Commissioner Carr just said, I am very happy to see that we're developing the area because it's housing that we need in Tarpa Springs. So we appreciate that you're doing that. Are there any public comments on this item? Anita Pros 901 Bayshore Drive. I hope this passes unanimously. Everything Mr. Mavramatis and his family have done in Tarpon Springs has been stellar. His motto has always been not only in Tarpon Springs itself, but in the Greek community, make Tarpon better, be proud of what you do. 
He maintains all of his developments he does. He uh, maintains all of his rental, <clears throat> and he has really been a good steward of our community. He takes pride in what he does, as does his family, and he's never really had any problems. He doesn't let it go down. He keeps them painted. He keeps the uh, uh, grass cut. He, the, the flowers are beautiful. He has really, really shown what a dedicated man is to his community, and he honors his name and his family's name, and they have done outstanding development in Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Any other public comment? We hear none. Any other commission comments? Before I make a motion, Mayor, I just want to reiterate uh, some of the positive things that staff and uh, Mrs. Protus have said about the project. This, you know, within our community redevelopment area, this project is will act as a catalyst for the uh, Safford Avenue corridor. Um, you know, 36 units on this corridor that we're hoping to link the downtown and the, the sponge docks. Uh, Combined with Mr. Kokolakis' efforts, I think will certainly go a long way, and you'll con continue to see uh, good things happen along the corridor. So I'm in support of it, and I move approval. Second. Second. We have a first and second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Terrapenny? Yes. Mayor Lahusis? Yes. Thank you. And now we're going to uh, item number 13, which is the application. 1944, 19-44, License to Encroach, Athens Place Apartment. So this application is a companion to the last application. It's basically an agreement. If you look on the site plans um, that were submitted, there's a small um, walkway that they're asking to put over an unconstructed alleyway at this point. And as a result of um, we have had long talks about you know how they get from to their amenities because their amenities are north of the of the main uh, apartment complex so we came up with this as the solution we talked about possibly vacating that right of way but it's really premature to kind of have that conversation we just haven't had enough development on this block that butts up against uh, spruce street to really tell me whether or not you know this is the time to do a vacation. So Nick and I kind of gone, kicked that back and forth um, a little bit. So we, did, we settled on um, the license to encroach agreement as an option because it's a temporary option for, for now um, until they determine, we kind of see what happens in that neighborhood. Because I share um, your, your hope, um, Vice Mayor, that this is the, one of those catalyst projects that we start seeing more development um, along Spruce Street. We ha and we did have um, a tourist home come in not too long ago on that in that Spruce Street area. So I'm excited to see if there's more things that happen in that on that corridor so we can make that decision. At the end of this um, alleyway that's unimproved is our pond. And when the pond was constructed, it was constructed slightly in the alleyway, so I really don't want to have traffic going down there. Um, so so allowing for this um, particular um, boardwalk type uh, bridge, I don't really have a concern. We've, we've given him a 20, uh, a 20 year time frame for that to happen. Hopefully that's enough sufficient time for us to decide whether or not that alleyway is needed. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Um, hopefully in the next few years we can find that, I, I, I hope. Um, I really just hope that the whole area up there takes off. Um, so that's what I've proposed for you um, in this agreement. You can always revoke these agreements. It's one of these things that I, that I bring forward to you um, from time to time is that these are improvements that go in your public right of ways generally is usually what I end up having them in. We had um, Mugs and Jugs has their handicap ramp in and their grease trap in, in one, of the one of the right of ways there because there was no other place to put it. So we get these from time to time. Um, you can always revoke these with the, basically it's a 30 day notice. So I don't really see um, any impact to the community because we can always pull it back if we do need that right of way but um, it would it would facilitate their movement to the those to and back and forth basically to their amenity area and we'd like to do that because it's just really low in that area so they're going to be basically walking in a swamp um, <laughs> that whole site is low <coughs> on that side so that's really what the genesis of this application is thank you for explaining that um I don't have any problem with that. I support that. Any uh, any questions, comments, Vice Mayor Terrapin? I'll just add some background to the staff presentation, which is, you know, Heather alluded to it at the very end. The whole reason they're asking for a bridge is because it's a swamp. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can't walk through it. They're, if you can't walk through it, how are you going to create an alley? So 
I, as a matter of fact, when I was on the Planning and Zoning Board, there's a, we had an application come before us for a new construction on Spruce Street, and it was mentioned during the, uh, during the board comments that the code speaks to uh, utilizing alleyways in this particular area. Well, the alleyway is unusable. So if it's unusable, you know, how are you going to use it? So uh, I think in the near future, it would probably behoove of us to just go ahead and vacate this particular alley, alley you know, and obviously take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But there's no function or utility out of this alley as I see it. Thank you. Commissioner Stevens. I agree with uh, the vice mayor. Uh, I think I, this whole project, I'm excited about. I didn't say this earlier, but I'm very excited because it will start some development, and, and I want to see that connection as well. And I think a bridge, as, as Vice Mayor said, that is, you know, a swamp. So <laughs> uh, I don't think it would be used anyway. So um, I definitely agree with this. Any other commission comments? No. Are there any public comments on this item? If you are none, I'll mm -hmm. entertain the motion. Motion to approve. Second. Second. And roll call. Mr. Donovan? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Terrapenny? Yes. Mayor Alahusis. Yes. Thank you. Have a good evening. We'll get some rest. <laughs> Next is item number 14 is potential sale of uh, Lake Boulevard property. Staff report, Mr. Liquors. So, this is a unique case I've been dealing with. We're really planning, was dealing with it, and then it came to me to deal with. Um, it's about a small, very small piece of property. It's surrounded on all sides by one owner property. The one owner owns all the property surrounding it. There's no access for us to get to it. Um, normally, we had thought it may be a simple process. As you know, we previously at a meeting um, decided how to vacate right away and the simple formula, the $200 fee vacating the right away. Unfortunately, even though this was formerly a right away, it was the old Lake Boulevard. I'm sure you can see on the map, you can see that it was unfortunately technically it doesn't fall into that because somehow in the whole process is it just got it got taken over by the city so it's a piece of property of the city not a right away where we could do the simple vacation right away the whole problem of the owner of the property that surrounds the whole thing including the little bit of what you would call right away right next to the green um and all around it is that the cost for an appraisal is $1,500. Right now, this little piece of property, again, which the city has no access to, is listed as $85 on the property appraisers list. Um, so it's just a hard mechanism to deal with and and in talking with them about since the right-of-way situation with the $200, since that won't work with it, um, the fact of having to give him an appraisal, get an appraisal, do the land, on a piece of, of, of property that's $85. So I wanted to bring this before you. Um, obviously, you see in there the attorney was asked that, and, and he thinks we should get an appraisal on it. But I wanted to bring it to you and hear your opinions of how to deal with this small piece of property um, and maybe another way that seems more fair to the property owner to do. But I, I was looking for your direction on, Mr. on that. Mr. Lequeurs, is the... Uh Property only his plans to uh, develop this area when he's asking for this land? Um, I'm not sure, but again, he surrounds it on, it's a little piece in the middle of, of his property, of his properties. If, you, if we give you the uh, authorization to negotiate, how are you going to know what the price will be? Well, $85 just doesn't sound right. It's like you're going to the restaurant. Well, again, dinner. if I go five times the appraised price of there, you're only at five hundred dollars. If I go ten times, you're less than a thousand. <coughs> it's going to cost fifteen hundred for get the price. If, if I mean, if that's the if that's the the will to go by the rules and what to do, it's just I mean, that's what I'd have to tell the the property appraiser. I mean, that's why I'd have to tell him that he'd have to get if he wanted to do the property. It's just you know. A dilemma that hasn't come up and uh of course the the resident kind of objects he's gonna whatever they owe us fifteen hundred dollars and we're talking about a hundred by twenty piece that the city has with no access to and again if it was a right away like it used to be it'd be a very simple process and we could complete it for the owner it'd be simple right but but because of how it was deeded to the city it's not so it's just a unique case that probably won't come up again 
in 10 or 15 years. Um, but I just want to get some direction on what the board thought on this. Again, the recommendation from the attorney is to uh, complete the appraisal process. Yeah. Here's the problem, Mayor. The problem is the appraisal is going to cost twice as much as the appraised value of the land. The appraisal in itself. That's why the property owner is asking for some favorable consideration. I understand that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean in the, oh, yeah. in the yeah. uh, my belief is the attorney has given you his recommendation based on our code. So in some cases, there's some interpretation within the code. My thinking would be this was right away, right? One time. At one time, it was right away, right? But it was right away. We just passed an ordinance that said you can buy right away for $200. What's no longer right away, but it was right away. And the only reason the city has it is because it was right away. That's the only reason we own that property. So I think it's a unique situation. Any other uh, ideas, Tony? Uh, I believe the property is for sale, including this parcel already, for $350,000. Um, that's just based on what I saw on Realtor.com. For me, I think it would be best, yes, in the past it was right away. Uh, today, it's not right away. It's an issue that we're running into formalities from a city standpoint. Common sense says it used to be right away, so should we do that? But from a the correct way, I think, would be to go the appraisal route because that's what we would require from anybody else, I believe, in this situation. If it was right away still, it would be an easy, an easy answer. Um, the common sense still goes back to me. It used to be right away, but uh, that doesn't always prevail in government and the decisions that I have to make up here on the board. So with that, I would move forward with an appraisal because of that very reason, because it's not right away today and it's actually owned by the city. To me, it doesn't make sense to spend the money for the appraisal when that property is not worth what the appraisal is going to cost us. So I. I I have to disagree and, and say not do the appraisal. Um, yeah, I understand that this is a unique circumstance, but I don't think it's unfair to ask that we get an appraisal of the property. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what precedent that would set that we don't go forward with the pr appraisal and we make a special exception here. And I know that this is a unique situation, but then again, in the future, people are going to be able to point to this and say, well, hey, you made a special exception here. What's so different about our unique situation? Um, I, I wouldn't want to make the exception here um, just because I think the city needs to know the value of the property that we plan on selling. And even though we may have an idea of what it is until we get that official appraisal, um, you know, it, it's not done in pen and paper. So I, w I would want to get the, get the appraisal. Want to get your first? Okay. Well, even though that it is a unique situation that the value is so little, but we have, I agree with the recommendation of the city attorney that we should, the appraisal should be completed, even though that uh, logically makes no sense. But if we do it for one person, we have to do it for others as well. So I will agree with the city attorney to uh, com complete the appraisal. Are there any uh, public comments on this item? Any public comments on this item? Yeah. I think we discussed I, it. I, I've heard it. the consensus of the board. Yeah. Or we can actually get a motion. Let's get a motion on A motion to uh, ask the property owner to receive an appraisal or have an appraisal done on the property and that uh, I would approve the sale of the appraised value to the property owner that surrounds the property that is in question today. Second. Roll call. One minute, Mayor. I'm going to recuse myself from this vote given that I sold the surrounding property to this gentleman. Roll call. I don't want any ill perception. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? No. May I lose this? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and now we're going to uh, item number 15, which is a sewer project priority list, Bay Short, staff report. 
Actually, as you see in the backup, this is something that came out of our first uh, grants meeting. If you remember at the workshop, Commissioner Donovan had the I had uh, the concept of us doing um, a committee dealing with grants. One, one of the suggestions of grants, but that one we had our first meeting, um, as I sent you in, in the update. And this is something that came out of it as we were going as a round table to talk about upcoming grants. We talked about the calendar. We talked about a lot of things, but one of the things that was striking, I thought I needed to get on the agenda right away when we were talking about what we want to look for. Um, really, the next big um, sewer project that we'd probably be the most el eligible for grants for is um, the Bayshore Drive because of what this commission did with the development of Bayshore Heights because of the upgrading of the lift station, we have the capacity to probably do between 75 and up to 100 homes on there. So when you're talking about grants, um, since we have a lift station already there with the capacity, that would probably be the most likely. And again, we're hoping uh, over the next year, two or more, a lot of these infrastructure projects and grants for not only solar, sewer, but stormwater are coming about. So. We knew we had a previous list, and, and Bayshore Drive was was on it. This this list has been a long time list, as you know. We're almost complete with the first one, Lake Tarpon, which has probably been over ten years to do in four phases. <laughs> um, we're beginning the Sea Breeze Drive process. I just want to get consensus for the board, and as we start looking and start going for grants, that obviously the best chance for a grant in this area is the Bayshore Drive. Um, because of the circumstances that's happened, and just to get your consensus that that would be the that would be the one to move forward with with looking for that. So I just want to get that consensus from the board tonight. Mr. Lequeurs, thank you for bringing that forward, and uh, thanks to you, uh, Alicia Donovan, for bringing it up at the work session. One of our goals is to eliminate septic tanks, especially from the sensitive area. This is a sensitive area, and it, in my opinion, it should be moved forward to the top. And wish that you should research it for searching for more grants <coughs> to get it to get it going. Since we're talking about this, uh, can you give us an update about uh, how we do with the late tarpon? I think we finished the uh, third phase. Didn't We're we? going on to the fourth phase. We're going to the fourth phase. Yes. Okay. How, how are we doing as far as we're going to get in the hookups? We're, we're moving. We're moving as fast as you can expect. Yeah, with that's those another yes. sensitive area. Yes. And sea breeze is another one that uh, we've been. In the works, to and that's in the beginning so, processes. To, to so go I on think we're on the right direction, completing areas that they are sensitive and moving, uh, eliminate septic tanks. So mm -hmm. I'm in favor to uh, to start the Bayshore Drive, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to uh, commend the city manager and his staff for paying attention to uh, not only what's going on within the city, but also what's going on in the state in terms of the grant funds that are available for uh, septic conversion to sewer. And also, I want to commend uh, this board and the previous board on our negotiation of the Bayshore Heights project and having the foresight to uh, up require the developer to upsize the uh, lift station so that we could um, do this, which is you know take uh, take residents off of septic and put them on uh, city sewer, which is a win-win for everybody. So uh, I'm all for moving it up on the list for the reasons stated in uh, the city manager's memo. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. I just want to echo the Mayor and Vice Mayor's comments. Uh, I think this makes complete sense to move forward. Uh, we've already got half the project done with the lift there, so I'm encouraged by that. And so thank you, staff, for moving forward with this. Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, I'm happy to see that the Grants Committee is already moving forward and getting things done. Uh, I'm also happy to see more homes get converted. Um, I was just curious, and this may be something that I have to get just an additional information as to how the priority list was done. Is it does it just go by numbers uh, in terms of like you know how many units we need to convert, or is the priority list based on like geographic location? Because I, I I'm glad we have a list, and I'm I'm looking at one two one through eight right here. Um, but I just want to know how we compiled the list. Is is the criteria just criteria based on the was again the closest to what the, the the you know the most damage into the environment is those properties in the north. That's why Lake Tarpon was number one. It's been a twelve year project. It was so big. We all know before the counts of the lake and how bad the lake was. So that that was a very easy and prioritized. And and then of course Seabreeze. We all know Seabreeze. So these were mostly related to which ones environmentally 
towards the waters and was ranked out. This was done a long time ago, but as you know, it takes a long time, especially with like Lake Tarpon took 12 years and four phases to go on. So, but that was the criteria, which is the most environmentally damaging. And as you can see, as they progress down, the, the ones at the top of the list are near water and, and the most, you know, the one we most need to convert to a sewer off the septic then for contamination. Okay, thank you. Oh, I agree with uh, the okay. commissioner's comments. Sir, yeah. I just said one, one thing that I think is important to note is, you know, we're also at a point with our uh, reclaimed water where we don't really, we can't create any more than what we're creating today. So my understanding is that, you know, you take more homes off of septic and put them on sewer, then it creates more volume of water that you can reclaim. So I think that's also a win-win for the city. I think we, uh, you have consensus. I do. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Any public comments on this item? Mayor Protos, this is your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we move on to uh, next item. Number 16, interest features, points, ducks, and that was uh, put in by uh, Vice Mayor Kara Penny. Vice Mayor, you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, put this item on the agenda this mm -hmm. evening. It's something that uh, has been talked about forever and a day, um, and in my opinion, can't really wait anymore. Uh, I know that we... Uh, had some uh, setbacks as it relates to this entrance feature uh, with some of the property owners on the corner of alternate 19 and Dodeck and East, and there's been discussion to uh, move past that particular location and take matters into our own hands, which we do a lot as a, as a city in terms of the betterment of the town. Uh, so we've talked recently about putting some form of an entrance feature at the city marina, which I think will tie in nicely to uh, the brand new facility that we're about to have. Um, so I wanted to put this item on the agenda to try and move something forward. Uh, my intent was not necessarily to move forward uh, the designs that are in your backup, um, but they do exist within our records. Uh, so I wanted to use that as a, as a starting point for tonight. Um, I'm not a proponent of uh, rework Generally, that would be something that would be a giant no-no to me, but in some cases, something is better than nothing as it relates to this entrance feature. Um, so I want to throw it up to the board for uh, discussion. What's in your backup is just, you know, a point of reference. Uh, we don't have any engineering plans as it relates to that entrance feature, but we do have basically a conceptual rendering. Um, so I'm happy to build on that. Um, we're happy to, you know, hear what the board has to say in terms of, uh, you know, a, a new design, but it needs to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and something at some point is better than nothing. So uh, leave it up to the board. I know Commissioner Carr in uh, maybe our work session or another meeting, he had a sketch that was pretty attractive as it relates to this entrance feature. Uh, you know, obviously you could potentially make this a public art project, but I will not be satisfied if it takes a year. So. I'm looking to do this sooner rather than later. I'll throw it up to the board, Mayor. Commissioner Schieber. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing this forward. This is something that we've discussed for a long time, and uh, actually I've been meeting with a small group of business owners on the docks, and uh, that's a priority to them. They, you know, we've been waiting a long time. Um, I actually discussed this with Mark because we've already paid for this design, and. And I thought maybe this could be a way to start uh, myself. We could always add to it or change it around. I know the Public Art Committee is, is also uh, thinking of, of coming up with a design, uh, but I don't want to wait a year either. <laughs> so um, whether we meet with them and, and you know give them some direction or we decide how we want to move forward with this, I think that we need to, to start making some decisions. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor, thank you for putting us on the agenda. This is obviously a passionate area for the whole board. We've had multiple discussions over the past 
a uh, year and a half or so uh, about these um, amongst the different boards that have been up here. So thank you again for putting us back on the agenda. Um, from the renderings that have been done in the past, uh, I do value um, Mr. Hoffman's designs. Um, I, I don't necessarily think they fit um, for the whole docs itself, um, but I do think it's a good starting point. Um, maybe we could work with Mr. Hoffman further to uh, give him some guidance. Uh, I think this would be a good idea for uh, the board to give guidance also to city staff instead of waiting to go back to the public art committee. Um, and we could potentially have some art components added to the sign where they could help out with. Uh, but I think it would be a good idea from the board's decision to direct staff to come back with a, um, a, a more historic characteristic uh, part of the sponge docks. Um, there's a lot of history, obviously, uh, this dates back to the early 1900s uh, in this part of town. Uh, and we have a lot of visitors that visit Tarpon Springs and go specifically to the sponge docks as well. Uh, some of the discussions I've had in the past and some of my recommendations from an artistic standpoint or just from a design standpoint in general was to stick with some type of um, brick um, that's similar to City Hall and then have some type of cast iron or powder coated metal that would go vertically and then go across the road as well. Uh, and the design that Mr. Hoffman has, it has a sign here with the sponger helmet. I think that's an important thing to include somewhere on the sign um, or somewhere on the, the archway. And I think an archway would be best instead of like a flag that is in this design. Uh, two things I think the archway would ha um, hold up better to the weather. Uh, you're looking at a sail that maybe need to be replaced more often than not. Uh, and you have obviously uh, some sponges or some other things hanging from this uh, with some guide wires. Uh, so we may run into some issues with um, areas to put the guide wires and also just from people running into them, et cetera. Um, but again, I think it's he's got some good design elements. He has a, some type of uh, crab trap or fish cage. He's got sponges. He's got the word sponge docks. I think those are all important aspects. Uh, but I think the sail part isn't necessarily what represents the sponge dock as a whole. Uh, obviously, fishing is a big part of the sponge docks. Sailboats were the how the spongers got out the sponge in the early um, 19, mid 1900s. Uh, but still, I think there's an opportunity to improve this uh, further. And I've sent out some um, some just rough sketches myself. And uh, I, I think it might be a good idea to ask city staff to come up with just a or work with a, a design company or sign company to come up with a better sketch that encompasses more of um, the history, more of a uh, more bold sign that uh, fits the character of the sponge docks itself. So like I mentioned, uh, brick bottom, powder coated um, poles that would go out of the brick bottom and then something that goes across the top, it says welcome to the historic sponge docks. Then at that point you could find um, if it's some type of statues, putting either the tarpon fish, sponges, crab traps, uh, a sponger, um, a sponge boat, uh, maybe the lighthouse, channel markers, uh, grouper fish, um, something along those lines um, to have that in the entrance. So you incorporate the history and then you're also capturing the, um, the entrance sign as well. Commissioner Donovan. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor, for putting this on here. Um, I really like the idea of an entryway to the docks. Um, I think it really helped the area, but we, we got to make sure we get it right, and I understand the urgency. Um, but we definitely, I'd like to see more designs and styles than what we're presented with here. Um, another consideration is that the entryway needs to be high enough for um, deliveries. I know a lot of businesses in the docks um, actually have big, whether it's U-Haulers, um, maybe not necessarily 18-wheelers, but there's a lot of tall trucks that go through there to make deliveries to the restaurants and the sponge to businesses. So we'd have to factor in the height. Um, and then also, I, in terms of the design goes, I'd look for something more, um, you know, more, more distinguished, more traditional. Um, maybe explore around with something like Commissioner Carr submitted uh, about a month ago. Um, but really, I think at the end of the day, we just need to see more, more designs, more options to look at. Because um, I, I appreciate this design, but it, it's almost a little bit too uh, too Disneyland, I feel like. It's it's just kind of incorporating every aspect that we could have possibly thought of about the sponge docks. Um, I'd like to see something a bit more, more traditional, more dignified um, for our sponge docks. So, again, I'm glad we're discussing this tonight, but... Um, I think we need to come back with more designs and more options. 
I have a question. So uh, who will be making these designs? Are we going to go to our staff or <clears throat> like, you know, I like the idea of an arched design as well. Um, and you talked about brick. Uh, we use the Columnian stone and the Nyads uh, project. So I, I think that would be really appropriate, since, especially since it's a local company that's importing it. Um, but what are we? What direction are we going in? That's that's what I want to make clear tonight. <laughs> Mr. Lecour, you finished? Yes. Okay, Mr. Lecour, if I remember correctly, the reason that uh, this gateway was not installed is because it was a question about the location. Do you remember that? Well, we we were we would have had to gain some land from the from the old Pappas property. Okay, is that? Still has to happen in order to have this gateway. No, the the objective would possibly be to look at relocating it down close to the marina, so we could incorporate city property, so we wouldn't have to do that. So the first thing we look at is the location on where we could locate it, and it'd be on city property. That way, we don't run into any of the problems yeah. with dealing with someone else's property. Uh, that's my question. At first, we need to uh, identify it where we're going to place it, so we know what kind of design to have and how big is going to be the uh, design. But I like to have, I like to see more of my, that it represents the uh, the sponge, like the sponge industry. That's what people coming down to here to see. They, they want to see the helmet, the sponge helmet, or something like that. But I think we need to identify the area first, and then we, based on that, uh, see what area is available and work on the design. But we like to see several options before we decide, because that's going to represent <coughs> the city of Carpenter. You had another yeah. uh, comment. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to add to some of my comments and then circle back to how I think we should uh, move forward. Um, just, you know, for more backup and for members of the public who were opposed to the, uh, for lack of a better term, SpongeDoc fiasco, um, the, my recollection is is that there were, you know, the, that, that project went pretty far in terms of uh, multiple meetings and design elements, and there was a list of of el design elements that we were presented with, and with on that on that list, Mayor, I'm not sure if you were still on the board or not. Was you weren't, but on that, you know, there was let's say there was 15 design elements. One was the boardwalk, one was the entrance, one was a look at observation tower, et cetera. The board at the time selected certain you know certain design criteria that they liked and that they were okay with. Now, ultimately, the whole project you know got scrapped, right. but the entrance feature was one that was basically unanimous in the fact that everybody said, okay, we like that element. Now, again, I'm not proposing that this is, this is the design, but it's a starting point, right? So how we move forward, I think the way we move forward is you mentioned about where it's going to go. Obviously, we need to know exactly where it's going to go, and maybe, uh, maybe we can get with some in-house engineers and, and say, okay, we know that we need X amount of feet of clearance, and we want it to be an archway, so how big, does our do, how big do our bases need to be on either side of the road? And they're going to say, okay, they need to be 36 by 42, whatever. Right. And that's a starting point. Starting point, where it's going to go, how big our bases need to be, what our height clearance is, and then I think simultaneously this board can independently submit to the city manager in a time frame design elements that are important to them. Sponge diving helmet, maritime, Greek flag, whatever is important to you that you think you know, as a representation of the sponge dock past, present, and future, and submit certain elements that we think are important. And then at that point in time, you know, we can further develop this criteria and then whether we feel it appropriate to submit to the public art committee to run with or we want to run with independently uh, as a board and submit a request for proposals. Whatever we do, I think it's important that we offer as much direction up front, where it's going to go, height, et cetera, uh, to where we can move forward as timely as possible and most effectively. Uh, this is very, I mean, we need to move forward. Really is that going to take a long time to come back with that information about location and some of the facts? Let's start on it right away. Okay. Thank you. Hey, yeah, you got another? No, Commissioner. Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I think we kind of talked about where it would need to go, you know, based on our city property there at the marina. Um, I know that the Public Art Committee has done some renderings, and I don't know whether we should ask them to show what they've done already um, and, and work with the engineers or the city to, uh, to design, but I, th I think it would be nice to at least uh, ask them what they've done so far. 
I, I agree, and I think that it's also important if we are going to go to that. Well, first of all, if they've already done something, send it over, right? I mean, right, but, right. But uh, in our work session, I, I pulled that public art ordinance and, and listed some things that I thought were important, right? And within that, there's different ways that the public art committee can, can go out to bid for a project or not go out for bid, but select an artist or whatever the case may be. So they have some, some longitude in how they can do things. So, you know, maybe that's also something that this board says is that, okay, public art committee, we want, we want to see X, Y, and Z, but we want you to, to go about selecting the artist or the project like this, which right, is one of right. those three things that they can do it. Go out to everybody in the world to submit, or only people within Tarpon Springs, or only this artist, or whatever, but actually, you know, really give them as much direction as possible on how we want them to run with this project. I agree. And I think that's one of the I ways agree. to do it, by saying utilize this aspect of your ordinance. Right. I agree. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. We'd like to go to the public comments. We're missing the boat on the sponge industry. The ladies dancing around down at the docks are pretty, but they belonged in the park. What we should have had there is a statue of a Greek immigrant, a man from the black community that used to work in the sponge industry, and a Florida cracker with a basket of sponges that they used to do. Those were the men that made the sponge docks. They worked on the boats. Uh, for an entrance, you can have something like that on your pedestals. You can have a helmet with the light in it for nighttime, a helmet so they'll see what the sponge helmet looks like. On another pedestal, you can have a big sponge. You can have a basket of sponges. If the city can't afford to have the bronze made, then we can go out and raise the money for it. Put a tarp and fish. What I see happening down at the docks, and I'm down there, I ride through there every day and at night. I've seen people drinking out of that fountain. I hope it's safe for them to drink out of it. And I've seen the homeless washing themselves with the water from there. We've also forgotten about the immigrants who first came over here. We need something to represent the immigrants coming off the train or coming off of a wagon years ago in Tarpon Springs. A Greek man, his wife, and their two, one or two children with a suitcase showing that they migrated to Tarpon Springs for the sponge industry. We don't do that. Or have the, the, a, sta the, a statue of the gentleman who created the sponge industry here. That's our history, and that's what would be there. Your father worked in the sponge industry. My grandfather, city manager's grandfather, worked in the sponge industry. These are the people that made it, and that's what we need to show. A basket of sponges out of bronze with all the sponges there on a pedestal, the helmet, immigrants coming to Tarpon Springs, a fine family, showing that they, they came here they put their sons as soldiers in the wars. Their daughters had families here. They made the sponge town industry there, the docks and Greek town. That's what it's all about. And that's where we've missed the boat on some things. Those are very important. I think the Art Association here did a, a nice job, but they didn't realize, I think, speaking to some of the women, what it really was. And I'm sorry that we don't have more of that down there for when the tourists come, they see and realize what's going on. Mr. Cheney was very influential, but we need to show the Greek families, the Greek men, and the sponges that they really worked with, because that's what the sponge exchange is all about, and the, and, and the sponge docks. Uh, Mr. Hoffman's rendering is nice, but that's not what it's all about. That's not what it's about. We need to honor what they came here for and what made it. A lot of people come to Tarpon again. They, they love Tarpon for the history, but they want to change everything, and you lose it. Just like it, I spoke about previously about the uh, bayou area and uh, the uh, fruit section of town. We've got to preserve our history, and you've got to be very cautious with these ladies, that, and they're fine ladies, I'm not criticizing, but they don't understand all the history of Tarpon and what it's about. 
you need to get, we have a fine artist here in Tarpon Springs, world renowned, and he can also help us with sketches, and I think we need to honor him with helping us get things down there. Look at the paintings he's doing. The helmet's in it, the plates are in it, the grass, the forks are in it, he's using sponges. Let's use what the talent we have here in Tarpon Springs and let them help us with the designs. Thank you. Thank you. Tina Bukavalas, 115 Athens Street, and I certainly agree with uh, many of the things that Anita said. And on that point, also, you might want to consider the, at some point, the list of over 2,000 Greek families uh, whose names I found associated with the sponge industry when you are honoring uh, the sponge docks. Uh, now, I'm going to address some things about the particular design that Hoffman had, because that's what was up on your agenda. That design is certainly cute, and, but Hoffman's style tends to be pretty much postmodern, and that that design is so, and it refers to the sponge industry with the design of the boat, but it's not really consistent with the vernacular architecture that we have in the Greek town historical district, and that's on the docks, and that kind of bothers me. It's, it's a Disney version, you know, of the sponge docks, essentially. Um, and the design also, bothers me because it doesn't take into account that what tourists are often looking for is culturally and historically authentic things, not generically cute things. And that's what I think that kind of design creates. However, I think there's some other problems um, having to do uh, with the whole gateway issue. Uh, and first, I want to point out that um, the Greektown Historic District, while it's not subject to municipal uh, historic preser preservation guidelines, is, <clears throat> however, uh, still, uh, uh, still uh, uh, a National Register Historic District, and thus it may be subject to a Section 106 review depending on where the money for this project comes from. And so I'm also interested in knowing how much money is this going to cost and where is the money coming from? If there is any federal money involved, then there needs to be a Section 106 review on anything you do down at the docks that's any kind of change that might have any kind of possible impact to the traditional culture or the historical authenticity of the area. Another problem I have with this design, I mean, and you can talk about that, and, but perhaps you can also later talk about where the money is coming from. Another problem I have with the design is that installing a cute but not, but not functional and not stylistically compatible gateway probably does not constitute the best use of financial resources in the Greektown district. The district has a lot of other needs. Uh, not the least of which is addressing some of the problems of rising sea levels. I know there are some things going on to address those things, but really we're going to lose a lot of those historic buildings pretty soon. There's already flooding down there and it is related to rising sea levels if there isn't more planning. And although it's our more, most visited area of the city, it has never received the high level of care and financial resources as the downtown district. And when I conducted workshops after the sponge docks design debacle about five years ago, the people down at the docks were pretty consistent about what they wanted to do. Why not ask them what they would like for a gateway or what they would like to do with this money? I think they deserve to have a voice in this. And not just here at the city meeting, because the agenda for these meetings are only posted a couple days before the meetings, and a lot of our senior citizens never get to see that agenda. It has to be something more within the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Athena Sardulius, and I want to thank uh, Vice Mayor Tarpani for bringing this up. and. I appreciate the enthusiasm from the board. I, I welcome the possibility of an entry feature. Um, I ha kind of have to agree with the other speakers. I think this is a good starting off point, but I, I feel that this is a very generic gen design and really not um, represented, representative of the 
rich history and culture of the Sponge Dock area. So I would like to suggest exploring, uh, communicating with the property owner that owns those two pieces of property right off of Pinellas Avenue to see, and perhaps this has already been done, if they would be amenable to allowing the city to put um, the feature there. So it would be the first thing on the corner. But I certainly understand the practicality of putting these things on city property if we have to. I mostly agree with everything that uh, Vice Mayor Tarpani has said and uh, Commissioner Carr, at, frankly, the entire rest of the board. Um, I don't know that the Public Arts Committee is the, the right um, agency of the city, for lack of a better word, to, to take this over, but certainly getting their input would be very important. I really like what Vice Mayor Terpani was saying, that the commissioners, who all have many years invested here, generations, um, give some specific criteria as to what they'd like to see on that. Me personally, I want a historical reference, something around 1899 when the channel was actually designated a federal channel. I think if we look our neighbors to the east, uh, the Henry Plant Museum, uh, Ybor City, that's very time-centric. It's about the same time that all of this was moved to Tarpon Springs uh, during the Spanish-American War. So we've got some great examples of beautiful ironwork in Tampa that's been restored. Maybe reach out to the Historical Society of West Tampa, Ybor City. I'm just throwing out ideas because you all have made quite a few good ones, as so have the other two speakers. So I am excited at this prospect. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. And if we can get more bang for our buck, if the city has X amount of dollars and perhaps needs help from the private sector, the businesses, we could start a campaign to help pay for this if we want to make, make it something unique, something that could also have lighting put on it for special occasions. Um, anyway, that's my comment there. I appreciate this as a starting point, but I think this is, this is not the right direction. And I understand what the vice mayor was getting at. Let's, let's get something moving, and I appreciate the thought very much, and I would like to help be helpful. Um, just to kind of add into uh, something Dr. Bugavala said, but this, I know the mayor has made some um, inroads in this and the rest of the commission. We really need to control that flooding because we lose a day's business every time it floods, as you know. News media focuses on a, pud a puddle. It hits the Internet. It hits Facebook, and then people don't come down there. So we, I appreciate this, but we really need that. That's that flooding controlled. Thank you very much. Costa Vada Kyotas, 538 West Cedar Street, uh, Tarpon Springs. Um, I had prepared comments, but I heard a lot of things that, um, that kind of thrown me off a little bit, so I'm going to kind of wing it a little bit. Um, with regard to the location, uh, just to give you a little history, when we put Live Oak Street in, it didn't match up with Dota Canese. Dota Canese was very narrow, so I went to Mr. Jack Pappas, who owned the properties at that time, and I asked him if we could get some of his property on either side. <coughs> and uh, he said, sure, take it, and off, you know, offered to pay him. He said, don't, just take it. Get the road in, and let's make it better. So you've got new owners of the property, but they may be receptive to work with the city, especially for some, something like this. And I, I highly recommend that they be approached. I know the owners quite well. Um, I think, Mary, you know them as well. And, and I think they should be approached before we decide to draw that entryway back town towards the, uh, the marina. Um, the one thing that I've heard a lot, uh, and I very much appreciate what you're saying, and everything that you're saying is correct. And the only difficulty I'm seeing is how you're going to converge to a solution. I mean, we're kind of all over the place here. Um, I, um, I'm very close to the Public Arts Committee. I'm very proud of working with them. I, had, I was at their meeting today, and I specifically asked them about how they fit in with what's going on right now. They don't. And so I think if there's some assumptions that you've made as far as what the 
public arts committee's role has been and will be in the future, I, I think that they need to be consulted with to kind of recalibrate your thoughts on that as far as what they're actually working on. Um, I think I'm in agreement with everyone that what we need to do is something very special. To be honest with you, I don't like sponge baskets. I don't like uh, sponge helmets. I don't like, you know, all the stuff, the, the trite, mundane things that that have been discussed is is somewhat troubling to me. I think, you know, we've got wooden boats and iron men. We've got a sponge industry, but it wasn't just Greeks. It was the same, it was, it was, it was people of all ethnic backgrounds, all colors. And I think in order for there to be a unique entryway feature, I think what you're, you're saying is correct, but I think it, it just, it tends to, to direct something that in, it eliminates the, the artistic aspect of what you're trying to do. Artists tend to take ideas the way you're describing them, and they interpret that into a piece of art that does not necessarily have a sponge basket or a diving helmet or anything like that, but it is very symbolic of what you're telling them that you'd like to see. And I would highly recommend that you think of getting a well-known artist, an interpretive artist that can take your ideas and develop in, into an entryway feature that we're all proud of that is actually a landmark in and of itself. So when people come to Tarpon Springs, they actually know from that piece of art being advertised that they are there. Just like Commissioner Carr said, the biggest problem he has, people ask him where the sponge docks is, and he says, well, you've already been there. You just passed it. There's nothing there. So we need something that is symbolic, very strong, to represent the strength of the people that created the sponge docks in Tarpon Springs for that matter. We, we should not fall short of that, and that's the thing that I, I would hope this commission would always keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Back to us. Well, to me, I think the first thing we need to do is identify where we're going to place it, and then, based on that, look for the uh, design. Uh, it is better if we do that on the intersection of Pinellas uh, and the Deccanese if uh, the order allows us to do it. Perhaps we need to go reach out to them again and see what does it take. We'll try again. The problem is it's been up for sale, and they're That's reluctant cool. to do it because of, of, of the property being up for sale. We can surely approach them again, but that's why, you know, we had before, and we'd asked again, and, you know, maybe it would be different, but obviously, you know, we can approach that again. But also, that's why we came with the game plan, you know. You know we can't yeah. wait till a new owner buys this stuff and then get his. You know, we may need to look at the alternative. And so we can look at, you know. It's been for sale for so long. Yeah, I've just got a, a quick question or statement. If I recall, there's a lot of sidewalk in that area. So the city may have some right-of-way in that area already with the sidewalk that we could look at. Um, or the city could look at to putting the sign and having a large footprint on where the poles go in or the base goes in. So we would look at all the way from yeah. the corner all the way down to the marina. We'd look at what so what actual we have. If it could be like a ideal site, would I would I would recommend the ideal site would be closer to the light, obviously where it doesn't obstruct the light. But then when you're driving down Pinellas Avenue, you're going to see the sign and you have to look far down. And then it would be ideal um, location and then a um, a secondary or second ideal situation or position for it and from a timing standpoint and i don't want to overstep vice uh, mayor here in this aspect any, but any quite finished with my okay. what i was thinking is first you need to identify where to place it how much land is available and then based on that we'll come up with the uh, design but we need to set up some kind of a criteria what things we, we're expecting to see what do we think is going to be good to represent the, the sponge stock, the sponge industry, the culture that we have down there. What's going to be interesting, just like what the uh, is today. So I think we need to have that on a workshop. It's very important that we have something right for the area. So we all can be proud. Commissioner Carr? 
We need to have this light. This scene. Yeah, I just I, we have a, a sign workshop coming up. Huh? We have a sign workshop coming up um, later this month. This falls under signs, I, uh, so I suppose. Too. Yeah. Um, I know you, you have some significant amount of time set aside for this. I think it might be an opportunity to have a discussion about this gateway sign as well at that time in further detail. Gives a little bit more time for the city staff to look at a few options. If we need additional time, we could look at that as well. But I realize that's next Tuesday. I don't need to. Vice Mayor wanted to move forward quick, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there could be certainly there can be something that we can discuss at that meeting as it relates to this. Yeah. Something. I mean, it can be at the end of the meeting. I don't care. You know what I mean? As far as Hello. Well, yeah, I feel like, I, based on what you just said, I feel like it's more than a sign. I think it should be an art piece. Um, and Anita mentioned uh, a local artist that we have. I'm pretty good friends with him. I think you're talking about Chris still. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll, be saying, I'll be seeing him tomorrow. I mean, I could always approach him and ask him to come up with some ideas uh, because he, he is a historic artist. So he you know, looks at every detail of, of history when he's painting. Um, and, and then we could maybe come back with some suggestions or also whatever the Public Art Committee has been doing to give us some kind of start. Um, so I was just going to recommend that. Uh, see if he's, I mean, he charges a lot of money, but maybe because he is a very much a community person, maybe willing to, um, to do some kind of sketches for us. I, I don't mean to speak out of turn. Um, Mayor, is it all right? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I've had some conversations with uh, Christopher Still also, and he said he's happy to provide some sketches about this. Uh, we've talked about some historical aspects. Um, he did express that he's not necessarily interested in doing a full um, artist rendition piece to it, but he's happy to do sketches to give to the city as some ideas that can be used. That's what I was going to um, ask. And for. so he, he has expressed that and is interested in, in helping and in, in what he can. So um, I think he's a great asset to, to lean on and he really wants to help out. So, um, And that would be a great start to have a meeting on, to have a great, that would be a great start. I'm having a meeting on. I and can again, ask him tomorrow. And again, I would prefer to have it at a regular meeting because, again, that way you can get the public input also as opposed to the work session where you can't. So I, I just offer that up, um, that when we bring it back, and it, that, it be at a, that it be at one of our regular sessions where the public can be involved in the discussion. <laughs> Put it number one. And again, we we need to identify the location. Like you just Absolutely. Yeah. Let me know if you want my my help with the stuff you stuff. You want. Well, again, we can probably adapt whatever. The, the important thing is 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 the structure, the piece of art is going to go there. We can adapt it to the size where we can go. So, so really, the you know that would be the most important thing. We can take whatever rendition and mold it to the location that we have. Finding out the right away, though, is an that important part, right? Yeah, so we can maybe do something like that. I just wanted to clarify the direction we're giving staff tonight. So basically we're saying go forward from this meeting, identify the exact location um, that we can do this at. Is that our, our direction for staff for now up until the work session meeting or our next regular meeting? Yeah, and also uh, Christopher Steele is going to provide, hopefully he's going to provide some design. <laughs> Okay. Because we're talking with that team today, yeah. Sure. I'm sure Again, he will, he's a nice guy. Thank that you. would be tremendous helpful. I say myself and Commissioner Carr, we, you know, I have, he does a lot better than me. I can only do stick figures. It, but, but something like that to go from, you know, his idea gives you the concept, but somebody like Christopher Still, we wouldn't need a full rendition. Just sketch out a model for us to take like this and put things in we like don't like that would be the greatest that's I mean, probably that, that would accelerate the process tremendously if we had those few things that he can probably do it real fast to go from he doesn't do anything real fast but I, i'm sure a sketch would be okay <laughs> he puts a lot of thought into what he does yeah. so mr the courage you have it an idea yep. you have a direction yes. of what we should do yeah okay 
Thank you. Now we're going to go to item number 17, the authorized execution of the letter of Board of County Commissioners regarding Anderson Park and Frey Howard Park. Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in the past, I've had conversations with a, a few county commissioners. Uh, one county commissioner uh, expressed that um, we should just go ahead and get rid of all parking fees at Fred Howard Park. Um, and the discussion was, is that when the economy had a downturn, uh, the county was trying to come up with additional ways to raise revenue to keep the county parks maintained, et cetera. Uh, they decided to charge parking at Fred Howard Park and Fort DeSoto Park, uh, one the north end of the county, one on the south end of the county. Um, now the economy is back in a much better place. We are still having these parking fees. Um, he, the, that individual was in favor of removing the parking fees, and I talked to another county commissioner. Um, he did mention that we have visitors from other parts of other counties and other people that come in town. Uh, so maybe we could work with the county, as like the city work with the county, to come up with a, a pass for the Tarpon residents to where they don't have to pay for parking at Fred Howard Park any longer. And then also it would help um, alleviate some of the stress that we see at Sunset Beach as well uh, from the individuals going there because there's, it's a, a city park and then we don't charge for parking at all. Um, so my request to the board is that we send a letter to the county administrator and copying the county commissioners uh, asking for the county and our city staff to work together on some type of pass that the residents of Tarpon Springs don't have to pay for parking at Fred Howard Park any longer. Uh, at the beach area. And then the second part of this uh, request is, uh, I did send Trish an email earlier today or last night with some pictures, but I didn't realize she was off today. I forwarded those to you via email before the meeting started. Um, but Fred Howard Park and um, Anderson Park has seen a, a large decline in the quality of the parks over the past five to six years. Uh, you're seeing areas that used to have grass no longer have grass. It's just sandy area, which creates erosion. Then you're losing the hills and the areas of the park. Um, you see more washout when we have heavy rains. Uh, you see areas that aren't maintained any longer where it used to be one big field. Now it's just a, um, they've gone back to a more of a natural look, a, a wooded area, but that's not the purpose of the park. We have the park that has the wooded areas, but then we also have the part of the park that has, um, areas of green space where you could play football, you could throw the baseball, et cetera. Um, there's a couple examples I'd like to bring up and you can see in the pictures as well. Uh, one example is at Fred Howard Park uh, and the baseball diamond, you used to be able to see the water and you'd be able to um, play kickball, softball. Then uh, when you're out there with friends or family, you could play Frisbee, football in the open field. But now the field has grown up, it has additional palm trees that have grown up in the area. They don't cut the grass. Um, Again, Anderson Park's another example on the hill. Um, they stopped cutting the grass at the bottom of the hill. There's a sniffing amount of area where you used to be able to play um, as a child. Um, and then when I was out there this past weekend um, taking pictures, you could definitely see where there's just lack of maintenance. Also, you can't see the lake any longer from a, um, most of the hill. Uh, a lot of the trees have grown up as well. Those are due to me, uh, those need to be maintained as well. Um, again, these are, these are property, or this property was donated to the county from a local resident that was living in Tarpon Springs. And I think it's um, our responsibility as commissioners to make sure that we hold the county accountable uh, for the parks that they're taking care of in our city uh, limits and also reflects uh, an image of Tarpon Springs. So uh, this letter is ultimately just asking for the county to work with the city uh, manager to come up with an annual pass and also if they could work on improving uh, their parks in North Pinellas and Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I totally support it. Um, I'm proud of the uh, of Commissioner Carr for taking on initiatives like this. Uh, just as it relates to his letter, I'm happy to sign it, but I do think that there are a few things that could be uh, wordsmithed, although I'm not one necessarily to do that. Uh, in the first sentence it says, as the elected official representatives for the city of Tarpon Springs, I would just say that as the, as the elected officials representing the city of Tarpon, Tarpon Springs, uh, and then add a third bullet point that basically s that uh, highlights some of, some of the concerns which Commissioner Carr just detailed, uh, and basically say it comes to our attention that X, Y, and Z you know, needs addressing. Or you can say it however you want. I just think that you should say you know, more so some of your concerns and what they are. Other than that? Go ahead and sign it up. I uh, support the concept. Uh, I think it's the draft is the right thing. The idea is there. 
I'll look at it again and make sure the uh, the ground was the and all that, but I, I uh, strongly support that. Um, just uh, last uh, last week, I had my uh, monthly meeting with uh, County Commissioner Eggers. One of the items that we talked about is the, the parking fee, and uh, he's in favor to uh, to have to eliminate that. Uh, he said he was going to talk to the um, to the administrator and to the other commissioners in the meeting that they have. Hopefully, they all agree with that. But uh, just to give you a little background, though, that um, Mr. LeCurs and I went there at the beginning. We fought for the seniors to uh, have a reduced price for parking. Uh, at least we got that. We were successful doing that. But I think it's good. I think now the economy is better. And I agree with you. It should be eliminated. We should be removed that. So, yes, I'm totally uh, supporting that. Uh, yes. Yes. Um I agree. Uh, uh, as far as number two, um, I, I walk hard park, and I do know the maintenance people there, and I know that they're on some kind of schedule because I've talked to them about it. Um, I might, you know, you included some uh, some different areas that need upgrading. I think Anderson Park is a lot worse. Uh, so I just wondered whether we should include examples of what need to be done uh, rather than be kind of uh, vague <laughs> on, you know, upgrades. Because if we have specific questions, I think we should ask them. Um, so that's that's my opinion. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely in favor of this. I agree with both of the points. Um, I can come up with more specific examples if uh, we want to make like a true list. Um, I know for a long time, it was, it was almost, uh, it was right after I had graduated from high, from high school, a lot of people would take pictures and mock the entryways because consistently the entryways were always missing a letter of, of some kind. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different examples. Um, again, I'm in the parks all the time too, so we, we can work on, on worrying about the, the examples, but I absolutely support the letter. Um, you know, these are county parks, but they're within our territory. Um, and it's just a healthy relationship with the county being able to communicate with them like this. So um, I'm happy to sign the letter. I, I have a question. Are we going to sign the letter as it is, or are we going to ask for some specific uh, examples or, or list some specific things that we want? Uh, I, I think we got to look at the draft again and see if any modifications we need to do before okay. we sign yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea to to uh, add some additional information, being specific about some of the areas that we would like to see addressed. Uh, we could talk, to, or I could make talk sure to Trish about that. We have somebody to proofread it and make sure everything's good. Yeah. Look for it. No, just what you're saying with two, you want two to more to more read like well, um, giving the examples vague. of the maintenance that the maintenance upkeep and stuff. Um, yeah, just maintenance, I mean, to me, is vague. Specific. Okay. Yeah. So if anybody else also, besides Commissioner Carr, if anybody else, like Commissioner Donovan, if you have examples of those, maybe, you know, we should send them to Trish so she can compile them, any of you that are in the parks. And, I, I, and I have, have that some to, examples. Because I think that's to, to specifically tell them what the problems are, instead of asking them, yeah, you got a schedule, but we probably don't like it because mm -hmm. it looks bad. So here are the improvements that we'd like to see in the parks and stuff. And, Okay. Thanks. A little good. Well, that concludes the agenda tonight, and we go to staff meetings. Chief? No comments, Mayor. Thank you. City Attorney? No, sir, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure. The clerk? No, sir. The clerk? No comments. No comments. Commission Carr? Uh, I don't have any comments. Vice Mayor Tampan. No comments tonight, Mayor. Commissioner Sieber. I have a quick comment. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Vice Mayor on the birth of his son, Marvel. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you now have a full family, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice party of fun. Uh, and, <laughs> and then I wanted to mention that we have Opalpalooza on the docks this weekend. It's a three-day event, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I'm hoping the weather cooperates. Mr. Dunn? 
Uh, yeah, congratulations, Vice Mayor. But other than that, no comments. Well, Vice Mayor, I already congratulate you, but it's never enough. Yeah, right. Uh, Thank you. Right. Um, I'd like to express my deepest sympathy to the families of those that lost the uh, uh, the loved ones in the traffic on uh, Virginia Beach shooting. Our hearts and uh, prayers go to the city of Virginia Beach. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of security in the public places. Uh, Mr. Liqueur, I'd also like to congratulate you for reorganizing all the departments in the city in order to increase efficiency. The only department that it has not been done yet is uh, the Office of City Manager. If you please take a look at that and see what reorganization that you think you should do, let us know. Sure. That concludes the regular session, and it's adjourned at 10.44 p.m. Not even 11 yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Can we talk another 15 minutes? Yeah, I know. Close. <laughs> not even 11 yet. Just round it up. You sure you don't have any?